to this meeting of the Dunedin City Council for the 25th of May. Uh, in the interests of uh, health and safety, a reminder for those of you uh, who are new here, or perhaps uh, tuning in and on your way uh, to, the, to the venue, the toilets uh, where you'll find uh, out through the corridor here in case of a fire, the unlikely event of a fire, uh, leave the building via the stairs and assemble in front of the Civic Centre. If you're not able to do this, exit via the doors uh, on uh, my left behind staff and either go down the stairwell uh, uh, and, and follow, that's not a complete sentence, uh, and in any case, follow staff instructions. Uh, in the case of an earthquake, please remain in the building. It is safer. Move away from windows and any equipment and furniture which may topple. Uh, take shelter under solid furniture such as tables and hold on, and an abundance of which we have, thankfully, uh, in this building in the unlikely event that those should be called upon. Uh, in all cases, follow instructions given by fire, warden, civil defence officers and emergency services. And finally, uh, in the interests of public health uh, and safety in the uh, global pandemic era, please uh, remember to scan in uh, at the door. Uh, or leave your details for contract tracing pur purposes. A reminder that this building, uh, the Municipal Chambers, uh, registers separately to the Civic Centre across the way. And that is our laminated housekeeping. Uh, our, our meeting will be opened in prayer uh, by uh, Sri Ram, which is uh, a late amendment to the agenda for the meeting, but uh, welcome, sir. Prayer will be in Sanskrit followed by the English uh, translation. Om Vakradunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Samaprabha Nirvignam Guru Medheva Sarvakar Yeshu Sarvatam Swasti Prajabhyam Paribala Yantam Nyaye Namar Gena Magi Magi Shaham Go Brahmane to Subamas to Nityam Loka Samasta Sugino Bavantu Kale Varsha to Parjanyam Prativisa Shia Salinim Tesho Yam Shobarahitam Brahmana Sandu Nirbaya Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jodir Gamaya Mridyoma Amartam Gamayam Om Shanti 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 Him O oh Lord, with the resilience of millions of sun, please make all my actions free from troubles. May there be happiness for all people. May the rulers rule rightfully on the earth. May there be welfare for the animals and men of wisdom at all times. May all beings be happy and prosperous. Let the monsoon be plentiful and timely. Let earth be covered with vegetation, let the country live without problems, and let good people never be afraid. Let me lead, uh, lead me from ignorance to truth, lead me from darkness to light, lead me from death to immortality. Let there be peace, peace, peace everywhere. Thank you. Welcome uh, to uh, council colleagues, to staff, to journalists, to those uh, members of the public either here in person or uh, joining us uh, via broadcast either now or into the future whenever you are tuning in. Welcome. There is no public forum for the meeting. There is an apology from uh, Councillor Staines and I'll move that we accept uh, the apology. Seconded Councillor Gary. Thank you. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. A confirmation of the agenda. I'll move that Council confirm the agenda uh, with the following alterations that items 23, 24 and 25 uh, be taken before uh, item 14. Seconded, Councillor Alder, thank you. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Uh, declarations of interest, any amendments to be made to the interest register? Being none, I'll, I'll move that Council note the elected member's interest register confirms the proposed management plan and notes the executive leadership team's interest register. Seconded, Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Those against? 
Uh, that's agreed. Confirmation of minutes, uh, item six. I'll move that the council confirm the public part of the minutes of the ordinary council meeting held on the 13th of April uh, 2021 as a correct record. Seconded, Councillor Gary, any discussion? Being none, I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item seven, minutes of, com minutes of community boards, Mosgiel, Tairi, Councillor Houlihan. I move that the Council notes the minutes of the Mosgiel Tairi Community Board meeting held on 17 February 2021. Seconded, Councillor Raddick, thank you. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Item 8, Waikawaiti Coast Community Board, Councillor O'Malley. I note, uh, I'm um, moved that the Council notes the minutes of the Waikawaiti Coast Community Board meeting held on the 24th of March 2021. Thank you to Councillor Raddick. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 9, Strathtaiuti, Councillor Lord. Thank you. The members can use their microphones, that would be helpful. Um, seconded, Councillor Walker. All those in favour? Aye. Those Aye. against? That's agreed. Item 10, Otago Peninsula Community Board, Councillor Wiley. Yeah, I move that Council notes the minutes of the Otago Peninsula Community Board meeting held on the 25th of March 2021. Seconded, Councillor Raddick. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. <coughs> Item 11, West Harbour Community Board, Councillor Walker. I move that the Council notes the minutes of the West Harbour Community Board meeting held on 17th March 2021. Going to Councillor Houlihan, thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 12, actions from resolutions of Council meetings. Councillor O'Malley. I'm actually not sure whether it's this or the next item because I have the printed version and I can't find it on the... Um, it's a question that relates to an item coming later, which is the COVID-19 response fund and the um, 11th, uh, 10th of November meeting uh, where we laid an item on the table. And I guess what I'm asking now is, can I get an update on that when we get to that item as to where that, I where that has moved? Absolutely, that's the plan when that item comes up, which I think is um, item 19, no, item 14. No further questions, I'll move that Council note the open and completed actions from resolutions of Council meetings shown as attachment A. Seconded, Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Item 13, Council Forward Work Programme. Councillor Barker. I have two questions. The first one's around the, um, oh gosh, what page is it? Page 35 on the COVID support fund. I just want clarification um, on the Council role. It says consider and decide on the allocation of the remainder of the fund, but the report today is for noting, so I just wondered if we'd have a bit of clarification around that. As per the previous question, I would assume that we can do that as when we get to the paper that speaks to that matter. And my second question is around the, um, on page 40 around the council controlled organisations and the letter of expectation for Dunedin City Holdings. And I note um, from the statement of intent that Dunedin City Holdings Board sent letters of expectation to the companies prior to the 31st of December, and we approved the draft in February 2021. So our processes aren't aligning. So I wondered if we could change the develop the draft letter of expectation to September to align with the Dunedin City Holdings process. I want to find the page. Oh, so it's, the top it's of page, 40. page, um, page oh, forty. Sorry, it's just that we we approved the letter in February, whereas Dunedin City Holdings are sending letters of expectation to the CCOs um, before the thirty first of December. So, in, doesn't it say maybe I'm um, reading it incorrectly, but it says we will develop our draft in October and November. develop the draft but then decide in February. But that's once we've sent it to them and then we get it back. So the process is we send a letter of expectation to them, they respond and then we decide on the outcome of that. So I could look at um, clarifying the wording but the intention of putting developed draft in October and November is so that we have a letter to give to them in advance of them advising the subs. Oh, so it will be changed for this round? Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
nothing further in which case I'll move that we note the updated Council Forward Work Programme. Seconded Councillor Elder, thank you. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Item 23 is in your supplementary agenda for those of you who are searching for it either physically or digitally at this point. Welcome Mr West and Ms Wikaida. The first item even in your supplementary uh, agenda. Anything any of you wish to offer by way of introduction? No, that's fine. Uh, questions, councillors? Councillor Barker. I had a question on page 34 of 230, which is around the strategy review and update, and it refers to the um, stage four, carry out revision and update of the strategic framework and individual strategies led by individual strategy holders, and I just wondered what that meant, because I assumed that council itself was the holder of the strategies, so can you just clarify that please? Sorry. Uh, I think what that refers to, Councillor, is the, the individual departments of those strategies, but you're correct. In, 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 in essence, Councillor owns the strategies, not the departments. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, Mr West, on page 27, uh, 5.2.7, opportunity, and again, it talks about in the conclusion, it says, there is an opportunity for DCC to stop benchmarking itself against other local government organisations at a time where the function purpose of local government is being examined. Why, I'm, I'm just confused, you know, why wouldn't we actually keep benchmarking and go down this pathway at the same time? I think from having worked with Harrison Grierson over the last month, I think it's, it's um, I, I think they're clear that the, the thriving cities model, the donut model, um, allows us to think more widely than benchmarking and actually the, the, some of the philosophy behind the model is around uh, ourselves as a community defining what uh, a thriving city looks like. So it's, it's uh, not, not using purely benchmarking as a way of, of determining uh, what, what a thriving city looks like. So I think it's, it's, um, it, it, it's thinking more widely than benchmarking. I can understand that. I guess the part I'm thinking, is, as I read through this whole paper and the, and the uh, workshop we had last week, is the fact that actually I would have thought you wanted to keep the benchmarking to show actually how good this model is and, and how it's more effective. And, you know, and use benchmarking because, again, I would... Your, your thoughts, Councillor, aren't so much of a question, though, at this point. I, I'm, I'm getting that. Would, is it not relevant to see where we position ourselves with the rest of the councils around the country? And it, so, look, I'll answer that, and, and benchmarking is still a useful tool, but I think that what this report highlights is that this is... We are taking quite an aspirational approach, and it suggests that we are showing leadership in a way that means that we are probably ahead of some other local government benchmarks. So, yes, it's useful still to be able to um, have benchmark data, but we shouldn't make that our, our aspiration if we are actually um, in a leadership role in this space. OK. Um, a follow-up question, and as I read through all this, um, I started thinking about the hospital. If we were going to run the rebuild, or the demolish and the rebuild of the hospital through this lens, how would that look? When we're not. No, we're not, but it's an example of, because this is quite a... Don't, Councillor, I don't think it's fair to our staff to expound, expand upon your analogies. OK. Um, do we have cost and budget for this, Mr West, and, is it, and do we know what its um, size it's going to be? The paper, it says that the resourcing required for staffing this work is included within existing budgets. Okay, thank you. Councillor Reddick. Um, on page 25 of 230, 
uh, item 4.2.6. Uh, in particular, well, items two, three, and four, but in particular number four, hold workshops with stakeholders as a means of gathering input, using available data and decide how to present strategic objectives and targets in the model. Yet, so why is that not included in our resolution? In other words, it appears to me that there is no co-design incorporated into our resolution. So if we look back to our resolution on page seven, the, the various well, so state. I'll, I'll save you the, the effort. The, the resolutions and the recommendations ask us to approve the plan to deliver on this work, which is everything that is set out in this paper. So by supporting the resolutions and the recommendations, uh, we are being asked to endorse the work that you have just highlighted. Uh, my reading of the stages in our resolution number 17, or part 17, is that we will um, come up with a strategy and then call for public feedback rather than co-design of the strategies. Hence the question. And what is part 17? Um, of the resolution, the council resolution on page 7. Hence why I referred back to it. Recommendations. Page 17 of, page 7 of 2.30. We have discussion topics. Five stages. I, I, I'm not, it's not clear which recommendations you're referring to, Councillor. The recommendations in the paper are on page 4. The resolution on page four is approves the implementation of the strategic framework refresh project plan. And the discussion about that plan, point number 17, paragraph 17, shows the stages, which ought to line up, to my, uh, in my perspective, with the development of a city portrait, 4.2.6 on page 25, which speaks essentially of co-design, holding workshops with stakeholders to establish the strategic objectives. And our discussion point on 17 is all about coming up with a, a set of strategies and then asking the public for their feedback. Well, I'll, ask, I'll, I'll ask the Chief Executive whether by, should the recommendations be supported by Council are we being asked to endorse the uh, discussion on the covering report or the substance of the attachment as the project plan? The substance of the attachment? So can I take it from that that there will be stakeholder involvement in the establishment of the strategies rather than a strategy presented to the public and then only feedback asked for? There's a substantial difference in my observation. In my observation. The plan is outlined on page 39 of your papers, and there are a variety of work streams there that explain what will happen in what order and what roles various folk will have. That doesn't, it, that doesn't pause. speak to the question. Well, it, it, it does insofar as you're asking what would happen if we approve the recommendations and how it will work as outlined uh, on the page, that, on page 39. That is the outline of the project program. I, it, just, it doesn't answer the question, I'm afraid. Uh, the question is whether where there will be co-design in the, in, the, in the strategies. Will the strategies be co-designed or will they be merely decided and presented to the public for feedback? There's a substantial difference between those two and well, my... There are, there are other questions, Councillor, yes. which, which we, can, we can take while you read through the... I'll, I'll take it as unanswered. On, Thank on 39. you. 39. But yep. Councillor Walker. Okay. 
Thank you, Councillor Hall. Um, yeah, my, my question probably leads on from the previous one because um, one of the advantages I see in this is the fact that this is largely designed by uh, the public. And on page 34, um, the, the, the suggestion is, and I think probably quite rightly, the feedback would be via the annual plan process. And of course, I think you highlight one of the risks as there is the risk the consultation may occur with only the stakeholders that feed into the annual plan process. So the question is, are you, have you thought about the mechanisms or how we'll try to prevent that happening? Or because it has been identified as a risk. So have we thought what processes we'd use to try and make sure? I know it's probably a hard one to, I can tell by your reaction, it's a hard one to answer, but it clearly is a risk. Probably all I'd say, councillors, uh, that uh, we are aware of that risk. And uh, the, the nature of this project <coughs> requires significant community engagement because uh, by its very nature, the thriving cities model is one of community engagement. So um, that will need to be um, very carefully considered as part of stage one, I would suggest. Um, yeah, thank you. And just uh, just let you know, I'm happy to move the recommendations on page four. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, is the purpose of this um, strategy to look at um, a more holistic approach to our city in this particular, you know, I suppose more the central city? Yes, that is the intent of the model that Council have chosen yes. so that we can wrap that into our work on the strategic framework refresh as well. And is it um, to increase, is one of the benefits you hope to increase the wellness of the people in our city or in general? That, the intent of the thriving cities model is to look at the welfare of the overall city in, in that sense. That's the, the purpose of the model, yeah. How do you see, what, what do you see are the main benefits to create wellness in a holistic approach with this model? Well, I think it um, allows us as, a, an, as an organisation to work with our entire community and look at all aspects of what a, th a thriving city represents. Um, and that's covered off in the diagram on the donut and, and talks about all aspects of uh, social wellbeing of the city. Do you see any key factors that we need to address imminently to achieve some of these results? I can't comment on that, I don't think. I think we need to get into this work and allow um, the, the governance group to meet and start thinking about that before we could probably answer. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Yeah, um, I, I'm just wondering, can you explain to me why, um, oh, in, the, in the briefing that we had last week, there was a talk about redistribution of wealth being a, um, a, a sort of almost a corner post of this type of donut um, philosophy or whatever you call it. And I'm just wondering, why would we think we should be redistributing wealth and how would you think that we will do that? So I think the model, if I look, turn it perhaps the other way around, Councillor, and, and um, it's not just about e economics, it's about the whole thriving uh, th thriving city so that's economics is forms one part of that is the way that I would see that that's the message I'm taking and obviously I'm still learning about thriving city models as well I'm part of that journey um, but my understanding is the economics is one part of what a thriving city uh, represents yes but the um, I can't remember the name consultant did say that a cornerstone of it was uh, redistribution of wealth, and I'm just wondering how, how we would do that. I wouldn't, on the one hand, I don't think it's fair to ask staff to comment on comments that have been made by others. It certainly wasn't my recollection of that discussion either, but um, the, the diagram showing the, how, how the various well-beings uh, interact, as Mr West has alluded to, is probably a more useful um, way of looking at that. And, and if I might remember councillors that staff are responding in this report to a resolution where council adopted 
the thriving city's portrait. And so um, we are simply providing you a report on something that you have asked you as council have asked us to do. Councillor Hulahan. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> would you say the main motivator for this um, strategy is climate change and uh, reducing our carbon um, emissions? Main motivator for <coughs> the work, as the Chief Executive just said, is the resolution of council. Well, I realise that, but so, uh, what so I'm talking about is the motivators council, council, around uh, this. Uh, Councillor, that's a political question, not one that staff can answer in terms of what the motivations of this body were in adopting a framework that we have. Is one of the main benefits of this strategy then climate change and lowering our emissions? All I'd say is what I've probably previously said, Council, Councillor, is that it's a, it's a model that looks at all aspects of a, of a, of a community, whether that be economic or climate related or uh, social well-being. It's a, it's a model that looks to try and capture uh, a picture and portrait of a city that reflects how well it is doing. Um, and I, uh, so it, it is a component of it, I suspect. Can you give an example, if possible, of any other city around the world? Because it sounds like we are leading the way um, with this in New Zealand. Is that fair to say? Has any other city in New Zealand done this? or No. So once again, we're being ambitious with our goals as a council. Um, because we're a progressive council. Is there um, any other cities around the world you can think of that have used this model? As, as per the paper, yes. But some people who are listening to this video may not have read all the papers, so that's why I'm asking this question, Your Worship. Well, there, there are other international examples, Amsterdam among them, but I don't know Amsterdam. if anyone's best time is best served by us reading out loud all of the papers for the meeting for the benefit of those at home. Well, no, I didn't read out all the papers. Council, I asked a, a question a around the paper. Yes, my follow-up question is, what benefits did they see in Amsterdam with this sort of model? I think this model is uh, uh, very new, um, and I think that was discussed at the workshop last <coughs> week. Um, I think even the likes of Amsterdam are still getting their head around uh, what it actually means and uh, are only at the very beginning of that journey. Thank you. I, I, I thank you. Councillor Walker. Yeah, probably a couple of questions just to, to follow on from what Councillor Lord and Councillor Houlihan Han said. Is it not fair to say that one of the great advantages of this model, it, it, speaking to Councillor Houlihan's question, is the fact that it's very flexible, it's very malleable, and it's, it's, that's the joy of it, its ability to change? So again, um, I'm on the learning journey of this one, Councillor, but it appears to me that uh, from what I'm reading and what I'm hearing as this model, as I, uh, as I educate myself through it, is that it's very uh, adaptable and uh, means it can be very responsive to communities uh, and their view on how they uh, understand uh, a thriving city for, from their perspective. Thank you, and you'll probably give the same answer to my next question. Um, going back to what Councillor Lord was talking about, he was asking if it was about the redistribution of wealth. Rather than it being about the redistribution of wealth, is this model more about moving away from the sort of recognised normal economic orthodoxy into a more circular economy thinking model? Yeah, so I'll probably point out page 16, 4.1.1, which is, uh, talks about uh, about that a little bit and, and basically says yes it is inclusive of economics but it's not purely about economics. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, just from the previous answer, can I clarify or just is it, are you asking us to adopt this strategy today when we don't know the benefits of it? Is that the case? We, we don't know what the benefits are? Is that what you were saying before? The council has already adopted the framework as a way of doing the strategic refresh work. What we're being asked to do today uh, is approve the, the plan that's been put in front of us for making that happen. Hmm. I mean, the donut is quite well known, I think, 
it's it's a great you know a good tool but just it would be good to know obviously if we're world leaders then we're not going to know but you're saying the reason we don't know the benefits is that it's so early we don't haven't seen the results yet we're a bit sort of guinea pigs a wee bit is that what you're saying well what we're doing today uh, is putting a plan forward for council to consider to, to allow us to do the work but that didn't answer my question is it is it that we're because it's so early we are we're in the well we're sort of like guinea pigs is it i mean you know what i'm so there's a work program in the agenda and it starts with stage one and we're not at stage one yet because we haven't approved the work program to get to that point so that is what we're being asked to do today is sign off on letting staff get on with the work that we have already committed to doing through earlier decisions I'm just trying to work out what knowledge we have of the benefits of these. I think there's probably a lot of benefits myself personally, but just for people who are listening to this and the general public to try to sell this strategy to them, that what they could expect to see is milestones from this strategy. What, what sort of things could we expect? Is there anything we could say on that? I think a lot of the benefits are covered in the paper. Uh, in the appendix uh, um, attachment A from Harris and Grierson. Um, but I take your point, and I think as we move forward with the st stages one through to seven, if, if approved by council today, um, I think we need to uh, be really cognizant as a, as, a, as a governance group on how we involve the community and uh, take them on the journey with us. Thank you for that. Look, could I just go back and ask again, could you just mention a couple of those benefits? Because a lot of people won't have read through all of those, even though we have. They won't know what we've read. So Councillor, just to... Councillor, it's not the, the function of staff in this context to be paraphrasing and summarising the agenda papers. They're here to ask questions that people might have having read the papers and not understood them. That is where we're at in the meeting. I thought that was a valid question to ask some of the benefits. Is that, are you saying it's not? Oh, I don't think it's the role of staff at this point in the meeting to summarise the papers that we have had that we have before the meeting. No. Okay, thank you. I think we have to be careful that we don't brush do, over do things questions? for the public. Do you think the public should know a bit more about this? Well, the, the, as the project plan outlines, the entire model was predicated on uh, deep and ongoing public involvement. Yes. Councillor Walker. Um. Sorry to ask questions, and forgive me, Your Worship, if, I, if I'm treading on dangerous ground here, but uh, it, uh, the question again is to clarify something that is very obviously stated in here. Um, this is a strategic refresh. Would it not be fair to assume that part of the modus operandi of doing this is to, in some way, get better cohesion between the current eight strategies we have? <laughs> So yes, that is the case. And the second point is, of course, as we have stated on many occasions, um, what bounds our eight strategies, uh, the Treaty of Waitangi and sustainability is not as perplexingly undefined, is not again the modus operandi of this review to try and better clarify those two things. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Um, Mr West, I wonder if uh, you or Ms Whakahari would have a comment to make on page 35 of the report. Um, it talks about in the next steps section in the last paragraph, the thriving cities tool does not require perfection, um, and it continues will a willingness to engage and a desire to get started uh, are key points. Would you have any additional comments to make on that statement? Um, no, I think that well explains the approach uh, that I'm hearing, uh, which is just, just start somewhere and get on with it and review it and Thank involve you. your community. Been moved by Councillor Walker, seconded Councillor Gary. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Um, yeah, I will. Thank you very much. as I collapse in front of everyone here. Um, yeah, thank you to staff, actually, for um, what I thought was a significant um, and very well-written report. Um, and as the CEO has stated, I think um, potentially an aspirational move for this council. Um, 
as I just stated, I think we can agree around the table on two things, that there is um, a total lack of cohesion amongst the current strategies, and that the, the, those, two, those two principles that bound the eight strategies, uh, namely the Treaty of Waitangi and, um, and um, sustainability, thank you, uh, Councillor Barker, are rather undefined, um, which is, I think has always been perplexing to, to anyone looking at it. Um, so I guess addressing those two issues alone um, m sort of moves me to want to support this refresh in, in, in many ways. Um, not only can we dis define and measure sustainability out sustainable outcomes of Dunedin by embedding the thriving cities, city portrait model via the refresh, but we can also, uh, at long last, I think, look at uh, working truly in a partnership way with, uh, with Mana Whenua. Um, I guess on top of this, we also have the opportunity to, to work far more cleverly with the Dunedin public in terms of consultation and collaboration, um, as well as reviewing and updating our current DCC strategies, some of which um, I think you'll agree, Councillor Barker, are looking rather dated. Um, I guess there's also other benefits of strategic framework that um, I'm sure others will, will speak to. Um, I think there's that that there are many. And I think, as has probably been highlighted by a couple of the questioners, there may be some angst and nervousness out there, or around this table even, and out there in the wider pub public when it comes to the thriving cities model, because it is new, and anything new tends to, tends to throw up uh, questions that, you know, as we've found out from our staff, are quite hard to, to answer. They've alluded to the fact that they're also in a learning, on a learning curve in this as well. But I'll just give you a brief overview of why I think um, that why, why I support the, the donut economic models and more specifically the thriving cities, city portrait tool. Um, I'd actually argue that Dunedin is thriving already and taking on this model gives us the chance to be innovative and to be a leading territorial authority and actually to thrive better. And whether we like it or not, I, again, I don't know if I'll get agreement around the table, but the orthodox economic approach to what we have done in the past of extracting, designing, producing, using, and disposing is no longer acceptable to most, particularly those young people who've marched in their droves um, from the dental school to the octagon. It's certainly not sustainable. And the Thriving Cities model offers us the chance to focus our attention more cleverly on a circular economic um, model where we can actually design out waste and pollution and keep products and material in and regenerate natural systems. All you have to agree, agree positive society-wide benefits. Um, and of course, this, this all works. If, we, if you have read beyond just the papers into Kate Raworth's model, um, it all works towards that, creating that what they, she describes as a safe and just space for humanity or in other words, a safe and just space for all the people of Otapoti and Dunedin to thrive. Um, and to put it in simple terms for those around this table of maybe a, a different political persuasion to me, all we're actually proposing here is that Dunedin becomes home to thriving people in a thriving city, but at the same time, we all try to expect the well-being of all other people and the health of the whole planet. Not a bad vision, eh? Um, and the good news is it's not, it's not all dictatorial hogwash. It's something that is designed by the whole community. They'll identify what will be the portrait tool that specifically applies to Otapoti Dunedin. It will become something that is totally relevant to Dunedin's local communities and Dunedin's environment. It's, a, it's actually a perfect collaborative tool, and it is truly, remember this one, it's truly flexible. If something doesn't work, and it is not relevant, it will be factored out by the community. And finally, for me as an elected member, this provides the council with an opportunity, once again, uh, to be leaders and not followers. And I think that's something we're starting to do, and it's something I think we should continue to do. And as we all know, the very, the very purpose of um, local government is about to be reviewed, reviewed in, in the Beehive by central government. And we're about to go under the microscope. So benchmarking ourselves against other territorial authorities is beginning to look like a dated concept. Adopting what's in front of us today gives us the opportunity to lead in terms of working together with the community 
and Manifenuet to divine what is a safe and just place for all Dunedinites. Ultimately, it will allow us, I think, if we adopt this today, um, to continue to aspire to be one of the world's great small cities and to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barker. I support this. We all know I'm a fan of recycling, so out comes last December's speech about strategy, updated to reflect my relief that we are finally on a long-awaited path to sort out our strategies and plans. What a relief to see this reward, report and plan. As someone with an economics degree, I welcome a new cohesive approach to our strategic direction with a modern holistic approach around a circular economy. It's exciting to see an integrated approach. We've seen this used recently by the Seniors for Climate Change who presented us with a fulsome Carbon Zero 2030 plan using the Thriving Cities portrait method. We can learn from them. As everyone knows around this table, plus council officers, I've been questioning over the last year about activity reports. I am, as one councillor recently called me, councillor strategy. Last December, I asked that the strategy work be prioritised as urgent and fast-tracked, so I'm very happy to see this plan. When I worked at council, part of my frustration in leaving was what I observed was a failure to follow expensive, consulted on, agreed strategies and to keep them accountable. My frustration and annoyance increased exponentially on my five years outside council and was one of the reasons that I stood for council. During the elections, I focused on strategy, which was boring for the layperson. I wasn't promising groins, bus loops, or anything remotely sexy, just concentration on strategy and governance. As a business person, I absolutely know the importance of strategy and success, and I wanted to help refocus council on accountability around its strategies. As I stated for the ODT, my key priorities are to ensure that Council delivers on strategies which have been agreed and paid for but not delivered. Over the last year, I've been banging on about the age of our strategies, Council's failure to have measurements, implementation plans, and Council's failure to monitor and measure and refresh these strategies. The December report on our strategies by um, Harris and Grierson uh, was a little damning and very clearly points this out, especially a line that said, no simple or formally embedded process for ensuring that strategies are reviewed over time and referred to a number of the strate strategies review dates passing without being reviewed. I've heard the frustration in the community over the failure to implement and, mod and monitor our strategies, especially around the economic development and social wellbeing strategies two of our four key well-beings. Strategies seem to be used to justify actions, not lead them as many agreed actions fall by the wayside in favour of new shiny activities. Our role as councillors is governing. I consider our number one role is to set strategic vision and direction in consultation with our communities, to formulate high-level goals and policies and ensure these are implemented monitored and measured. If we don't set vision and strategy, we are merely lurching along, as one person commented to me, headless chickening. Setting our strategy should be our highest priorities. How can we make 10 year planning decisions when our strategies are outdated and probably not fit for purpose? In the meantime, while we are working to update our strategies, I shall continue to ask at each meeting how the reports in front of us relate back to our current strategies, the collective promises we have made to our communities and the strategies which we of governance have endorsed. As I said before, I welcome with relief the work programme and look forward to much close engagement with our community of stakeholders to work on a suite of integrated strategies to ensure Dunedin thrives and becomes a place of choice for people to flourish and thrive. So I excitedly support this uh, resolution. Thank you, Councillor Hulan. Thank you. Um, yes, anything that um, is sustainable, is holistic, and increases well-being for the people involved, I think is a good thing. So I do support that. I, um, I love the fact our council is being ambitious and looking at taking on things that are new and innovative. I think the donut um, model has a lot to be, um, you know, a lot of good benefits in it. So uh, I think that's a good thing as well. To review our strategies is well overdue, as Councillor Barker mentioned, and I think that is a good thing. And I think the first way to achieve a good um, strategy is to have an, a strong overview and goal focus, and certainly having a, a vision around what we want to see in our strategies helps all of those that coalition. 
So uh, my, I have a couple of concerns here, and they are around consultation for the public and the governance body of that. My, my concern, and it's only from previous um, uh, consultations we've had in the past, particularly around George Street, is who would be involved in the governance? Would they be people with certain views that they want to push on people? Um, who would be the members of the public? How would they be chosen? Would they once again be people with certain views? And it certainly is the, this council has, I think, perhaps gained a bit of a reputation for pushing certain ideological ideas. And my concern is around this, that they will get the most focus. And uh, so while I agree with all of this and I will support it, I'll be watching very closely what happens and how we go about this. I also want to mention at this time, there was a couple of comments made during question time, uh, you had that covered in a workshop. Now, I think we have to be really careful that we don't stop the, the transparency or the openness for the public on information that we're sending out to the public by dismissing things and saying, oh, they're dis discussed in a workshop. That is not the intention of workshops as far as my understanding. A workshop is for us to get more information on things, and I think it is fair and reasonable to ask questions around the benefits of a um, strategy like this or a, a, a something so new, as one of the other councillors mentioned, it can be a bit scary for the members of the public to um, agree to something like a thriving cities uh, vision when it's new and they don't know much about it. We don't know much about it either, I think would be fair to say as a council, but we're moving forward and I'd say I, am for myself, will be moving forward cautiously but also excited at the ambitions for our city. But to be told that it's so new we don't have any idea what the benefits are means that we are taking a risk. I'm happy with that. And it also means that the sky's the limit or it could be terrible. So I think what we have to say is let's see how it goes and be open to be flexible. If it's looking like it's not working, we may need to do a U-turn on our donut. Thank you, Councillor. I, I would say that the comments that were made around um, asking staff to paraphrase or summarise the paper before us had nothing to do with the content uh, that was discussed at the workshop. It had everything to do with papers that are in the public domain. And so there's no lack of openness or transparency. All of the papers for this meeting are public uh, and are available for people to read through. And I think uh, suggesting otherwise is, un is unhelpful. Uh, and I think um, one would be, um, uh, would want to be careful about that. But no, you can't. Councillor Raddick. Thank you. I, um, I very much support the thriving cities portrait, and I like the um, Harrison Grierson report and the donut model. It's a, a wonderful model, and I think it uh, is emblematic of the uh, current times that we live in and the movement that we're having to have a more holistic view of society and how we all interact, uh, live, and behave within it. However, our implementation of the plan uh, to engage with this model is rather unsatisfactory. As clearly stated in the final punchline of the workshop presentation we attended just last week, inclusion of all parties and opinions is paramount to have a genuine community model and uh, genuine community strategies. However, I refer to the discussion point on stage two, which is uh, back there on page number seven of 230. Stage two includes developing an initial city portrait and development of a strategy guidance document to be used by all strategy owners to guide the refresh of their strategies. The development of a stakeholder engagement plan to guide community involvement is also part of this. And thereafter comes the feedback. So that's where the community involvement happens as far as feedback, there is no stakeholder co-design evident in this process to my view. 
And the essence of a good working model for the city is co-design and inclusive participation with our whole community, bearing in mind that public consultation is the lowest rated element of ratepayer satisfaction as far as DCC leadership is concerned. So there is quite a feeling in the community of a lack of participation. So Councillor Walker's suggestion that the strategies will be designed by the community is exactly how it should be. But typically, that is exactly how it is not. I agree with Councillor Barker. Our role is to set strategies in consultation with our community. And I would further ask that, you know, in line with my question, that the, we have workshops that enable the community to come up with their strategic ideas and that those uh, community workshops are inclusive and enable participation at the beginning of the project rather than being fed a pile of strategies that they get to comment on and that's it because there's a very strong feeling out community that whatever comments they make will be ignored and that was something that came through loud and clear as we had our 10 year plan uh, consultations in the community getting their feedback <coughs> and many people said why bother making a comment when it's not listened to so you're listening to people at the beginning is critically important therefore I ask that this resolution that the noting and the approving be taken in two parts because I can support part A, noting the thriving city's portrait, but I cannot approve the impl implementation of the, uh, the, the implementation project plan that we have in place at the moment. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. I um, just want to comment a few, a few statements earlier on. Um, one would be ideologies, the term ideologies. I would argue that everybody has ideologies. Um, you're just not aware of your own. That's the, that's the fact. Um, and I think when it comes to consultation, I would agree that there's always... Oh, that's fast. Um, <laughs> I would agree that, um, that, that consultation can be a problematic and difficult thing to do, but, but often is not. Those who have been consulted and hear what they and see themselves in the consultation environment are satisfied and then don't speak up. And it's those who have been consulted and don't see themselves in it or don't get what they wanted are the ones that then will speak up and say, I wasn't consulted with properly. That's one aspect of it. The other one sometimes can be that people are not aware that an activity is going on because we really don't follow everything to that level of, of integrity. And then an activity comes out at the end and people go, oh, I wasn't consulted on. And that's, that was actually a fact, but the reason they weren't consulted on was in fact because they weren't aware the consultation was going on. And that will be the challenge going forward with this. Thriving Cities, the thing about it that's quite useful is that it's a very flexible model. It's very city, city specific. It's not the same for any one city to another. So therefore it's not forcing us into a, an outcome that we don't necessarily um, relate to. It is effectively the model to which the strategy development then pins itself towards. So it's a descriptive mechanism of understanding where we're going. It's holistic. And I find it, it was interesting that um, Councillor Law took out of, uh, out of our workshop that this was a wealth distribution model. I have a feeling that, and I, it's possible, but, but I don't think that in the instance of what was being said, it was, it, you're taking into account the fact of economic and community and, and, and environmental inputs as well as the straight commercial input which has dominated economic models for the last 20 or 30 years and in doing so has missed out a lot of successive, um, successful behaviours in economies. So I think this model is going back to a point actually which preceded the 1980s when community and other such things were considered and part of an economic model. The term guinea pig, um, I don't want to get into the model of vivisection, but guinea pig doesn't have much control over its future when it's in the guinea pig state as described, and yet leaders choose to be where they want to be. We are choosing to be leaders, not guinea pigs. We're not, this is not being forced upon us. We're choosing to take the opportunity and move forward and lead. And I just want to finish up, though, with I don't want us to adopt 
new strategies and update a new model and walk away and declare success. Because just going back and looking at the recent past, we joined the Covenant of Mayors in 2015. Then we, took, when, then we adopted the UN Sustainable Development Goals in 2019. And I think each time we declared what, how amazing we are, and I'm not really sure that we then turned around and said, now let's turn this into, well, we didn't update the strategies in 2015 or 2019. So as we adopt this new model, remember, we were adopting one only two years ago and has barely made the discussion here. I'm worried that in 2024, another new model will come along and we'll adopt that and we will forget that we're adopting this one. So I encourage us, I, I'm very excited about doing this, but just to walk away and say we've done our job now by adopting the model is, is not the correct place. This is the start of the journey and the outcome will be determined by actually what we do over the next three years. Thank you. To the speakers, Councillor Lord. Um, I don't know, you didn't answer, Councillor Raddick, but I just wonder if you could take it in two parts. I, I guess the That's question, fine. the question, or the, the feeling I have at the stage is, um, and it's quite interesting, the two documents that the uh, previous speakers just mentioned, the Covenant of Mayors and the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, I, I don't really agree, or didn't agree with either of those, and um, I, I'm happy to note the report, but I do not believe that this is the best economic, or this is the best way to set our strategic framework. Now, I, I can hear people saying, oh, that's quick. I can hear people saying that um, that you don't want a thriving city. That's the obvious uh, conclusion that someone will say, oh, well, you don't want a thriving city. You don't want to communicate well with uh, Manifenua. But, you know, there's a lot of things that I think we can do well. But I just do not simply believe this is the right framework. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you. Um, I think we all know that the world is constantly changing and what we wanted a number of years ago changes as well and our values change and um, we're constantly informed and, and to be adaptable and change is really important which is why in fact we do need to constantly look at our strategic framework. We do need to see them in different lenses as time goes on. What we're saying here is that we want to see our strategic framework reflect our commitment to the Treaty, to, to, treaty of Waitangi. We want to, um, our strategic, strategic framework to recognise that we have to have a more sustainable and um, lower carbon future. And these are values that our communities are wanting us to reflect in our strategies. So I believe that is um, where we are going and that is a, a really good thing. I do believe, however, that we need to take our community with us so our communications around all these models need to be positive, open and transparent and, and so that people can understand actually the models we're talking about and engage with them and take them on board for themselves. And so to me the communications around these models is really, really important. To me the pre-engagement with our communities around this is really important. Indeed, co-design is one of those things that bring our people together with us. And I look at the um, work that has been done in St Kilda, St Clair, in the new plan, the plan around um, the coastal area, and there's been a huge amount of input from the community before a plan is made. And it's pulled people in and engaged people in a way that they feel like they're part of that. And I believe if we do our communications well and people understand what we are about and what the vision is about, um, and we enable them to engage with that and use the, the whole community's feedback to pull these strategies together, we will have a really good stra strategic framework, which in a number of years, because the world's constantly changing, will have to be reviewed again. So, yeah, I endorse this, and I, I note 
Um, the thriving cities tool does not require perfection, because often we expect that. Um, it simply requires a willingness to engage with its concepts and a desire to get started. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. I will be asking also for these to be taken separately um, and by division. The key part of, and I actually think Mr West said it quite appropriately, getting heads around the journey. And this is a journey and there is a lot of um, thinking and processes that have to go through to see how this model actually ends up being beneficial for our city. There are no other cities and towns in New Zealand, that is fact. Uh, on the um, Thriving Cities website, it talks about Amsterdam, Portland and Philadelphia. And I don't think we can really compare those to what we are going to do here in Dunedin. I am really heartened, though, about the Mana Whenua expressing an interest in using this approach to progress work with the DCC. And I see a lot of real positives coming out of it. But I really am looking at, as soon as we take away benchmarking and how we currently report, that's important for us as a council. But it's also important to our residents to give them a clear indication of how council is doing. If we believe this framework will outperform our current processes, guess what? We'll never know. I think we need to know, we need to run parallel processes. Benchmarking is vital but I think there's a lot of positives that will come out of this process that will be a benefit for the city. Councillor Officer. Tanako, your worship, I'd just like to uh, record my thanks to the mover. Um, I'm going to be supporting both parts of this uh, um, recommendation. And, um, and I also would like to uh, record my thanks and acknowledgements to the CEO um, for for the restructuring work that's done to put in place Manahotu. It is extraordinary, I think, that um, people are choosing to support <coughs> A but not B because actually we're actually speaking against the endorsement of the the structure the, the implementation of the project which is going to be led by um, our General Manager, Māori Partnerships and Policy. Uh, so I'd like to thank Ms Wikaira for her work on this report and also the CEO for the vision, because you cannot say you support the relationship with mana whenua without actually endorsing the implementation. Uh, Councillor Walker said that our city is thriving. Yes, our city is thriving. You can see that in terms of becoming a medium growth city, but there are parts, there are communities in our city that are not thriving. And this, the direction of this strategic framework refresh is actually putting people at the margins, particularly mana whenua and mata waka at the centre of our city. So I, I find it extraordinary that people are doing, supporting A but not B. So kia ora. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Worship, um, and thank you, Councillor Lafiso. Uh, I concur with what you've just said, and also what Councillor Walker said earlier. I wanted to start um, by thanking the staff for the report, which I remind colleagues is responding to our decision earlier uh, to go with this particular tool. And I also want to remind colleagues, because this often gets lost as time goes on and we have different trainings and different people around this table, that um, we're on a bit of a journey with our strategic framework and, and look how far we've come. Uh, there were multiple strategies not all that long ago and we're down to eight. And uh, what might have been forgotten as part of the process that we went through to get there, and I particularly remember um, a session at the Otako Marae uh, with Mana Whenua uh, around the environment strategy and that was a particularly moving uh, session to get to where we landed. Um, and I want to remind people of that. But yes, the time has come to refresh them. And, uh, and many things have happened. And I just want to remind people that this tool allows us to, to um, be bespoke for our city. 
And I take on, on board the points made about our thriving city, but in fact not everyone is thriving in it, and that's what this addresses. Um, I want to encourage colleagues to be <coughs> courageous in this. We've talked about leadership, we've talked about being holistic, uh, that this is progressive. Um, remember those things when you're voting, and have some courage to do the right thing and to be progressive and to be leaders in this. Um, we seem to second guess ourselves at times and not trust ourselves. Uh, and, and the point that Councillor uh, Elder made, um, she stole my line, uh, which was um, the desire to get started. This, this motion is about getting started. That's what we want to do. Um, and so uh, remembering that people are at the heart of this so I will be supporting both parts of it. I can't see the purpose in, in supporting one without the other. Um, so thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, it's certainly true that you don't have to look very far to find evidence of the failure of our traditional economic systems, most notice, notably the crisis called the GFC that did so much damage. And since that time, there's properly been a greater degree of scrutiny on how we operate in our communities. Um, I have to observe also that uh, there were a number of people who around, around this table and elsewhere in our community and international communities who wrote long, made long speeches, made wise comments and wrote long treatises while they were looking at the navels and lockdown about the opportunity that post-COVID or COVID or post-COVID world or New Zealand provided for all of us to examine how we operate in our communities and our society. Well, this is the time, folks, and it's a bit tragic um, to see those people who are keen on not doing things scratching around for reasons not to support entirely sensible motions that respond to what this group has already asked for. Thank you. Um, in speaking to this, it's timely to remind council laws of what they are being asked to support. We're not being asked to adopt the framework or to do the... You know, this, we've had that debate. This is a, a conversation about noting the update report uh, and approving the implementation uh, of the project plan which will make it happen. And as has been pointed out by colleagues already, um, we have uh, in the past uh, made decisions of and set direction for we, where we wanted the council to go uh, and haven't adequately resourced or prioritised the resourcing the organisation has to deliver on the aspirational goals that council has set. And, and I don't see how you can support uh, A uh, without supporting B as a, as a governor of, of this organisation. As Councillor O'Malley has said, you know, this, is the, this is the start of the journey. Councillor Wiley also used the journey metaphor, but then doesn't want us uh, to do the work to take anyone uh, on the journey uh, and wants us to vote against uh, the project plan for implementation, um, which, which I find extraordinary. Uh, Councillor Houlihan is concerned about certain views uh, and certain ideological ideas uh, dominating the discourse. Councillor Elder put it differently. She talked about values, but effectively it's the same thing, uh, and they are the agreed strategies and policies of this council. Th those are the things, and it shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody uh, that the work that we are asking staff to do is delivering on the agreed uh, strategies and policies of this council, however reluctant individual members may be for individual parts uh, of that work program. Uh, and so it's uh, useful to remind ourselves, uh, as others have, of why we are here. Uh, we have a strategic framework that exists but was developed in sequence. Uh, so when we wrote our economic development strategy, and, and I asked the question, well, what does that mean uh, from an environmental point of view, I was told, well, we'll get to that uh, when we develop an environmental strategy. Uh, and, and similarly, the discussions around sustainability and, and the Treaty of Waitangi. So uh, what this is doing is the long overdue work, I agree, of integrating the various aspirations and the various commitments that Council has made uh, with and to uh, our community. And while the framework is new and may look um, foreign to people, it's not particularly the, the, the ecological ceiling that you see set out <coughs> in the, 
strategic architecture is essentially our, uh, is essentially te Aotearoa, our, our environmental strategy, and the social foundation is effectively our social well-being strategy, things that we have uh, committed to but perhaps haven't resourced uh, adequately in terms of achieving what we have stated that we wanted to achieve uh, through those mechanisms. Uh, and this will give us the benefit of, I mean, this is an international community of practice. Yes, it is new, uh, but one of the things that's been overlooked, I think, and is exciting for me is the commitment that being part of this includes uh, to work with other people internationally that are doing this work. And, and that is a huge benefit to us, uh, to be able to do both that at the same time as create a model that is reflexive to our own local needs. It is a, is a flexible uh, model. Uh, I mean, I agree that it, it's no longer controversial. One, one has to think that suggesting you know, gross domestic product uh, alone is a metric of the success of our community. And I just, I mean, two stories chosen at random from uh, the newspaper this morning. One talking about how retail summer spending has seen GDP grow faster than expected. Uh, and a few pages uh, back, half of all surveyed children living in uh, housing that is too cold. And while correlation isn't causation, uh, you can't, you know, that it's, a, it's an illustration of the point that we need to be considering more holistically the well-being of our community. And this is a framework that allows us, and which we have effectively done to a degree with the, with the existing uh, strategies, but integrating them is the way that will make them, uh, make them um, work uh, to their full uh, capacity. This is about uh, leadership. I think this is something to be really proud of, actually, as a, as a city to be doing this work and to be making these commitments to our community and their, <coughs> uh, their collective and, and holistic well-being. Uh, it's really exciting work. Um, it, is, it is challenging. Um, from a, you know, it, it was, these are great papers to read. It is, uh, it is intellectually challenging work, and I think there will be a, a communications. Um, there will need to be a strong focus on how we have these conversations with our community, because um, we can't expect uh, them all to be uh, academics. God forbid uh, that they were, um, and, and and but that is something that will that we can work through this, because uh, it won't, it will, it will live or die on the involvement, the direct involvement of our community in doing this work and so that is absolutely critical to have that, to get that right uh, at the front end uh, of, uh, of this plan and I look forward to seeing uh, the fruits uh, of that labour. Councillor Walker, your right of reply. Uh, yeah, thank you very briefly um, and I echo many of the comments you've just made, Your Worship. Um, also, uh, like Councillor uh, Liffey, so I'd like once again to thank the CEO and the staff for, 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 for their work and also Councillor Lafito's comments around um, those people currently being left behind who you know, will, 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 will hopefully be given far greater opportunity to thrive under this visionary model. Um, great to hear largely broad support uh, around the table to approve, as the, the Mayor says, approve the implementation of the strategic framework refresh project plan, not design the whole, the whole thing. Um, to those who are nervous, uh, remember as I stated earlier, this is something that is designed by the whole community and yes, Councillor Houlihan, we should make sure this happens, that's partly our job. Um, in response to Councillor Radich, uh, co-design and flexibility are, is the modus operandi behind the thriving city, city portrait model. And it's worth remembering that consultation is about asking the public what they would like, not people getting everything they want and then complaining that consultation didn't work. Um, Councillor O'Malley, um, you raised some very good points, I think, in relation to us being sure that we carry out and carry this through to end point and not, not sit smugly on our hands just because we've ticked it off. So thank you for pointing Point, pointing that out. Um, I'm, like most of us around the table, it seems excited by us being aspirational and innovative in the way we develop strategies, look after our precious environment, collaborate with our public, and I think most importantly, how we partner with Mano Fenua. Let's be brave, let's be progressive, let's be proud, let's get on with us. Thank you. Thank you. People, have, people are happy for me to take A. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? No. Recorded, please. That's fine. And B will take by division as previously indicated. Councillor Barker. Aye. 
Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Alder. Yes. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. No. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. No. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 9-4. Thank you. Item 24, Māori Strategic Developments. Brief change in the seating plan. Anything either of you? No. Questions, councillors? Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. And thanks for the report. The questions I have are, are, are sort of relating to the role going forward that Mata Waka will have along with Mana Whenua. And there's a number of questions I'm sort of just going to ask that relate to that <coughs> point. The first one is that a Māori ward, am I correct in saying that people who can vote on that ward are those who are on the Māori roll? Yes, that's correct. And so that would be both Matawaka and, and Mana Whenua who are on that roll? That's correct. Thank you. And now I'm looking at sort of points 18 through 23, which go to the initial engagement um, and, and some activities that came out of the Māori um, Participation Working Party and then um, Hui that followed. Um, the, the first question I want to ask, because Okaha has mentioned quite a few times in, as an agency that, that, would, that we'll be working with and do work with, um, is Okaha um, primarily a mana whenua and naitahu funded and focused at group, or does it have a wider remit? I'm not too sure on that question. Um, Okaha works as a consultancy business on behalf of Runaka. Of the Runaka, so it, it, it was working then effectively for Mana Whenua. Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, and then on point 20, um, it was agreed that time to have more concerts considered in full discussion with the wider Māori community and council on the Marae needed to occur. I presume that's plural for Marae. Um, there, yes, there is it no, is. There, there is, is no, no plural. Is. Well, but there are three. Sp <coughs> there are three spaces in the city that you would call a marae. M sorry, councillor, marae is both singular and plural, as I would. I know, but I'm saying in that sentence, I presume your worship is being used as the plural, because there is no difference between a singular and a plural. I would need to know whether that was actually being used in the singular or in the plural. Was my question. So my question now is that it's being used in the plural. Um, what will the role of Arata Uru Marae be um, with the other two Marae in the city? And, and I guess my question gets, it's getting to <coughs> the role of Mata Waka and that being the Marae that they use. So the two Dunaka Marae are ancestral Marae. Yes. They're, they're Ngaitahu Marae and they whakapapa back through the centuries to this land. The Araita Uru Marae is a Mata Waka Marae, so it's an urban Marae and it provides a place and a space for Māori who are not from this land here in Ōtipoti. Um, the the Mātāwaka and Mana Whenua relationship is close and long-standing. Obviously, it has um, complexities, but moving forward, we do... My understanding is that the Council has largely focused its relationship on with Mana, mana Whenua, and we do need to consider the relationship of Mātāwaka. However, our treaty partnership relationship is with Mana Whenua, the people of this land who signed the treaty <coughs> here, and that is our treaty, treaty relationship and our treaty partnership relationship. There is a need to work together with Mātāwaka and Mana Whenua to develop a relationship with the Council so that we can move forward together. But in the first instance, 
the council needs to ensure that its relationship with mana whenua is first and foremost established on really solid grounds because it's not until that happens that we can fully establish a good working relationship with Matawaka. Thank you for that very thorough answer because I don't need to ask any more questions after that, to be honest. Um, so, but just as I just clarify, and, well, I just <laughs> want to clarify exactly, so I am sure before I stop. Um, you're saying that for us to do this properly, we need to work with mana whenua and get that sorted out well before we talk before we establish the relations with Mata Walker, and I presumably they will be used, they will be involved as we go through that development. That is correct. Thank you very much. Other questions? Councillor Elder. Um, just looking at the work from Okaha, has been... I can use your microphone, please. Ah, oh, it was already on, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, just a question ar around point 26, which <coughs> is um, Okaha's um, involvement in these work streams that are al we're already developing. Um, I just wanted to um, ask, so far, how Okaha feels about their involvement in these work streams and their input into them? It's my understanding that Okaha is um, developing and progressing good working relationships at an operational level with the council. Um, however, a lot of the work happens quite ad hoc and um, that is an ongoing frustration. Um, and there is a need internally to join up the way that we work with um, Okaha uh, so that we are not creating more capacity issues for them. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one was on that list of um, projects that Okaha was involved with at an operational level. Um, I didn't see the Peninsula connection there and I, and I was aware that um, staff were working with Mana Whenua around signage. Um, was that an oversight or, or is it Mana Whenua versus, rather than Okaha that, that we're working with on um, that? The, pro, the, the list outlines projects that I've been involved in since December. There are a lot more um, projects that Okaha and Mana Whenua are involved in and it was really just an opportunity to give you an overview of recent uh, projects that I have some knowledge of or involvement in. Thank you, Kilda. and that's really helpful. And on page 42, in item 12, it talks about the plan helping to raise the cultural capability and confidence of staff. Is there any uh, thought being given to, or does it include, uh, raising the cultural capability and confidence of elected members? Yes, the cultural capability framework work will, um, will be rolled out for both staff and council. Councillor Lane? Possibly this has been covered by the question Councillor Gary just asked, but um, I know, I mean, I think certainly probably all of the councillors around this table here, I can't speak for everyone, I can only speak for myself, but I personally think I would benefit from more knowledge around tikanga and Māori culture, and I think the minute you have more um, understanding of those things, it helps making decisions. And so I would urge, um, and my question is, um, what are we doing to help improve that sort of knowledge for councillors? What are we going to do? Um, so the cultural capability framework will outline a, um, a plan that that will be rolled out amongst staff and council. And one of the things that we will do first is to survey the staff to work out where everybody's knowledge base is at. 
Um, and once we've got some of that, we will design a suite of workshops that staff and council um, can participate in. Some of those workshops will be around te reo and pronunciation. Some of those workshops will be around what treaty partnership looks like. There's a whole range of, of um, opportunities for us to work, to create workshops that um, develop a knowledge base for DCC staff and for councillors to progress forward. Thank you. Councillor Reddick. So will that staff and councillor survey be in the form of a quiz? I've been working with HR. Um, they have a they have a survey um, already set. We've also been working with Tiara Fiti, that is the uh, organisation, government organisation that um, supports partnership, uh, Māori partnership amongst government organisations and the treaty settlement work. Um, and so we have, we will be looking at the, their cultural capability framework, which has been rolled out amongst a number of different government agencies. Um, they have a, they've already developed a survey, and from that survey you can pick different workshops that meet your organisation's needs. Thank you. Further questions? I'd like to speak to it, Councillor. Um, only to say that um, I'll record, my, again, my thanks to, to <coughs> the CEO and to Ms Kairia, um for this mahi. And as, as I said in the previous debate, um, our stra strategic directions and our strategic framework uh, are working towards, um, again, putting our relationships with mana whenua and latterly mātāwaka at the centre of, our, of what we do. Um, uh, and as Councillor Benson Pope referenced um, in the previous item, uh, COVID-19 um, lockdowns gave us a, a, a time to, to reflect and also maybe change the paradigm. Um, and I see this as very much part of that mahi, so thank you. Councillor Hulahan. Thank you. Um, yes, I hope that um, Mana Whenua and Matawaka see this strategy as a way of us strengthening our, try, aiming to strengthen our relationships with Māori. Um, I think it can only be a good thing. Um, Māori in all statistics currently for um, child poverty, for um, education, for health, uh, for wellness and economic um, viability are are lower than any other, um, what would you call it, um, any other different um, people in our community. So uh, I think when you are deal you know, Māori right now represents some of the most vulnerable in our community and I think as a council we have to be judged by the way we treat our most vulnerable. And I think this is a really good step to building those relationships and hopefully increasing the well-being of Māori in our community because they are part of us, they are the future of us, and uh, you know we're all together in this. And the better the people in our community are, the better and stronger our communities are. And that, to me, is a really good goal to have. So thank you to our CEO and thank you to. Um, <clears throat> Jeanette and the team who have worked on this and I look forward to seeing it progress. Councillor Reddick. Yes, um, this is uh, very good. There's lots of um, great work taking place in line with our uh, treaty and partnership obligations and it uh, is going very well from reading through this report so I'm very happy to note it and I think in um, comparison to the previous uh, discussion item on our agenda. Uh, the general public, although this is at a much higher, this is at a higher level of course in the nature of a partnership, 
the general public would also like to see the inclusive participation that we see in the Māori strategic framework happening with the uh, general public of Dunedin. Councillor O'Malley. General public haven't signed the Treaty of Waitangi. <coughs> um, <coughs> I'm actually really glad to see this moving forward and I hope that my questions were only just to check that we were ch taking everybody forward on the journey and I really appreciate the work that's going on and keep it up. Thank you, Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, as others have done, I want to acknowledge some people and I want to start by acknowledging uh, former Chief Executive Sue Bidros for her uh, establishing the position of Kai Faka Mahirihiri in the last triennium, um, and to Ms. Uh, Wikaira for her work uh, on this, um, and to CEO Sandy Graham for understanding and acting on this pivotal work, um, because this is important, really important work, and uh, how far we've come to get to here, but gee, we've got a long way to go. Um, and I just want to share with you something that I've experienced as recently in the last week. I always make a point of beginning uh, any speeches that I make on behalf of the city in Te Reo. Um, I'm not a Te Reo speaker, um, but I, that's how I always start. And I made a speech just recently, and this happens from time to time, where people uh, find it very difficult. Um, and make, make a noise. This particular noise was to my right. Um, and I don't know who that was, and that isn't important, but the point I want to make is that we still have people in our community uh, who we need to take with us on this, and uh, we have a wee ways to go yet. And it is such important work. Um, and I want to thank for the work done to date and the work yet to do uh, to keep people at the heart of this uh, to strengthen our relationships with Mana Whenua and Matawaka. Um, and uh, I look forward to what's going to happen next. Councillor Elder. Thank you. Um, I too support this. I think there's some great work going on out there. And I um, went to the Matawaka um, consultation at Arai Te Uru. Marae and realise we still have a lot of work to do to make our society fair and equitable for Mata Waka and for um, Mana Whenua. Um, the Treaty of Waitangi um, espouses partnership, participation and protection. And partnership has to be reflected in partnership through all our strategies and it also has to be reflected in the culture of the city and the look and feel of our city so that, in fact, we have an inclusive city that reflects the pride and identity of all our cultures, in particular our Māori and Matawaka uh, and Tangawhita Whenua, um, so that everybody can feel like Dunedin is home. So. I really um, support this and I'm looking forward to the outcomes of it. And thank you to um, all the people who have worked on this, the Māori Participation Working Party um, and Janine, and I'm um, looking forward to the ongoing work. To the speakers. Uh, I, I I will speak briefly and with apologies uh, to our local uh, folk. As the old uh, northern Fakatoki goes, the humble kumara doesn't speak of its own sweetness. And I do want to acknowledge uh, what is missing from this report, uh, and that's um, the work uh, that uh, that Jeanette and and Miss Graham had put into building the relationships in our uh, local community. Because the success of this work. Uh, will rise and fall on the, the, <coughs> the strength of the relationships that exist within this building and stretch uh, beyond uh, this building and, and, and out to uh, 
uh, the runaka, and so that is worth uh, acknowledging. And this is a great summary uh, of what's going on, um, but I think the most important bit is largely absent from the report, as you would expect uh, in, a, in a forum like this. But both the external relationships and the work going on to build internal capacity are both going to be uh, critical uh, for us, as is the fact that this is happening in parallel to the work we're doing with the, the Thriving Cities portrait and being able to integrate all of this into our, our strategic framework refresh. Uh, I look often at this, at this board here, it says proclaimed a city in 1865, and uh, we've got 150 plus years of catching up to do uh, in terms of uh, the work that the city is doing in, in uh, supporting uh, mana whenua and including them in the work that we do. We've spent 10 years really getting to the starting line uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, where we grow uh, together uh, uh, with this work uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and looking to how we can continue to uh, strengthen uh, the input of mana whenua and mata waka Māori in the decisions that we take and in the discussions that, uh, that we are having. And, and, uh, this report um, outlines the work that's going on to set us up to be able to do that uh, in the months uh, and years and hopefully generations uh, ahead, and, and I applaud it. Uh, Councillor Lofiesel, your right of reply? Oh, sorry, f any further speakers? Councillor Lofiesel? Um, thank you, Your Worship. Tēnā koe. Um, and tēnā koutou to the, to the colleagues who have spoken and endorsed this. Um, I'd just like to point out, and, and as I've said in previous debates, we really, um, as part of our professional development, we really need to learn about our history because the partnership that is referred to in the local government, you know, the, the principles and the partnership and the protection and whatever else the other P is, in the, in the Treaty of Waitangi, in the Local Government Act, um, was actually out of the 1987 lands case taken by the New Zealand Māori Council against the Crown. And that was the judgment that the government had to act with good faith with the treaty partner. Um, if you talk to tangata whenua around the place, there hasn't been partnership and we're still getting there. So when we talk about the treaty, that is different from te treaty, and that again is different from the principles. So we really need to do some work and not be afraid as tauiwi, as all of us who are not Māori, we need, actually need to have courage, as, as Council Gary has said, and embrace the treaty because it doesn't just belong to Māori. Because if we say it just belongs to Māori, then Māori have to do the work to get it honoured. Actually, there's two peoples, peoples that signed it, and we have to have a sense of ownership about it. So if we're, if we're proud to call ourselves, those of us who are proud to have a treaty relationship, a relationship with the treaty, with tangata whenua, then we can be proud to call ourselves Pākehā or Tauiwi, because that means that we're using an, a, another Māori word other than Kiwi, uh, to identify ourselves, so just have courage and go for it. Good, I'll take the vote. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Any abstentions? That's agreed, thank you. Item 25, uh, the Dunedin City Council submission to the draft Otago Regional Public Transport Plan. Mr Drew? <coughs> Ms. Benson, welcome. Anything from either of you? No, that is fine. Questions? Councillors, Councillor Barker. I wonder if we're on page 68, if um, we're giving feedback to the ORC that Palmerston is not part of Dunedin, that it's part of Waitaki? In this, sorry. I looked it up. We can add that if that's Council's wish. I think that would be useful. Councillor Wiley. I thought, there, I thought there'd be a flood of questions on this issue. Um, 
Question regarding uh, paragraph 11, the DCC supports initiatives to encourage regular usage of public transport system through fair discounts, fair caps, and welcomes OSC des desire to explore new funding opportunities. Can you just expand upon that a little bit more? What, do you, what is the thinking in, in that commentary? with the ORC to um, look at different fare types like $1 fares and different, the, uh, different structures for the fares for the students in particular? So it could also mean things like uh, a weekly pass or you know, if you uh, travel five days you get the weekends free, monthly passes, annual passes, there, there are a number of options that could be considered. Um, would it also include something like um, going through the Polytech and having uh, the Polytech pick up a, uh, a pass for all their students to have uh, and paying for that through the student fees into the Polytech or the same with the university so 28,000 students would automatically have access to the bus? I know there's been some talk about bulk purchasing for uh, the likes of those organisations. The, the detail of how that bulk purchasing works, I'm not sure. So, uh, what I, I just wanted, that's not what you're meaning by paragraph 11, is what I'm trying to indicate. Uh, that'll be one of the items for consideration. Okay. Um, and I'm thinking in regards to DCC uh, as an entity in itself. Uh, has any approach been made to the ORC where every staff member receives a B card? Um, essentially, it's prepaid for, so free access for the year. Um, you know, or something along those lines. No, not specifically that idea. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lord. Yeah, um, look, I must admit, I don't think I'm the only one in this room that struggles to read 550 pages between. Um, between Thursday and today, but I've just, I wanted to know in relation to the bus loop in that, um, I'm looking at page 141 of 230 and 140, did we have a particular um, view on which of those bus loops would be the best model to go for? Or, um, is there any conclusions drawn from that? I, I couldn't find a conclusion, I, I see the costings and all that sort of stuff and I, I'm, um, you know, very supportive of a a free bus loop in the inner city, but I'm just wondering if there was a conclusion drawn on which of those models would be the best one to go for. Uh, Councillor, no, no conclusions. So page 141 is just four of the eight options that were identified, so there's another set of four options. No, no conclusion. Uh, each uh, loop has its own benefits and disadvantages. Um, I guess the, the next stage, if that was to be endorsed by council, would be to work with ORC on you know, the best one for a trial, and, and there are a number of things that need to be considered. The impact on existing bus routes uh, is just one of them. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a question around uh, point eight in our submission. I guess it's a hot topic around uh, the bus fares, uh, the continuation of $2, $1 or a free. We make the suggestion in our submission that we would welcome the opportunity to work collaboratively to ensure affordable fares. Is that, am I reading that that's suggesting that we would work in a financial, financially collaborative way also, and if so, have those discussions been had? No, there's been no discussions at our officer level about um, financial assistance to the ORC. So in answer to my question, we're not talking about working financially collaboratively with them, so i.e. subsidising any fare reduction? That would be a decision for council, not staff. There, there is no allowance in the draft 10-year plan. Councillor Reddick. Uh, looking at the second tranche of loops, uh, perhaps page 214 gives a good uh, diagram, a map of option six. 
Why was a, a combination of six and seven not included? And by that I mean, why was a loop, the shortest possible loop, going straight through the octagon instead of around Moray Place and through the bus hub, and not considered? So that, what that means is straight down George Street and then back through the one ways, because in line with various uh, at desirable attributes of public transport, that would uh, be the shortest possible route and the fastest uh, possible route to make it uh, most convenient for people. Sorry, could you just clarify? So, so something smaller than option six. So if we start with option six, and instead of having, instead of going round Moray Place and through the bus hub, it would simply go straight through the octagon. And in that way, covering the maximum number of attractions, although not the bus hub, uh, but it would make the quickest uh, loop. So it's, a, it's like a combination of six and seven, because option seven does show a, a route straight through the octagon. I would, I would re remind councillors that we're not trying to design a bus loop at this meeting. There have been two pieces of work that have been done on it. Uh, as indicative of what it might look like that are being appended to a submission about the public transport system. Sure, so my question was, why was that not done? Is there, is there a, and an I don't know if any of the reason. authors, not sure if any of the authors of that report in particular are present. I don't know. Sorry, I can't you. answer. Similar questions as to why a request for a free bus loop uh, brought us back reports on something that wasn't free, but that's not necessarily the best forum to have that. Discussion either. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. That leads to my question is what control does the, our, us as a council have over um, prices of the bus? Buses. So we can submit um, that The microphone, please. Sorry. Sorry, that's through the submission, Councillor, that we give that feedback. Okay, so at the end of the day, um, ORC is in charge of any, everything to do with the buses, is that correct? Right. So when a lot of our decisions we make um, around, like for example, our thriving cities <coughs> and a lot of the direction we want to go in, rely on better public transport, what control do we have, if any, on any of that? This is the process for us to input into the direction of governance of the public transport system as it is currently structured. I'm just highlighting how frustrating it can be. That's not really a question, Councillor. Do you no, but you just um, inject interjected, so I just followed up. Okay, so uh, another question. Um, in, in here, is there any um, planning for a transport hub? Given parking was one of the um, lowest you know, when we asked in our resident survey, that was the issue that most of our residents had the most concern about was the lack of parking. And um, I think it was 20% of people who had a satisfaction with the parking in our city. So, and the changes of transport modes, like i.e. bikes, and particularly electric bikes that are really expensive, is there any, um, uh, you know, so planning this is, in this, this it's a, a valid question, is there any planning in this transport, um, you know, document for a transport hub that will accommodate expensive e-bikes, give more the parking? the Regional Council and their draft Regional Public Transport Plan aren't proposing building anything. Right, so the answer is no, is that the answer? Yes. Thank you. I'm allowed to ask those questions, Your Worship. I'd prefer the questions to be directed at the paper. Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you for these documents. Um, this has sort of been touched on when you mentioned the intent to implement a trial of some kind, of whatever route, um, because that was the, the original motion of the, this council which was also widely supported in the community. Um, given that th the report lists dozens of reasons why it would be a good idea and dozens of reasons why it would be a bad idea or an expensive idea or, and, and the astronomical cost of electrical charging infrastructure, 
is it, do you consider it the most sensible course of action to try to progress a trial of some kind with um, a low emission but not necessarily electric vehicle in the first instance to prove the concept uh, and see if it does yield the community support that we think it does? Uh, yes, correct. Staff would recommend a trial to prove the concept and um, doing that with ORC is thought to be the best method to deliver that concept. And in your discussions with the regional council, with your regional council counterparts, uh, are you left with the impression that they uh, are amenable to such a trial? Uh, I wouldn't like to speak on behalf of the ORC. They have a number of priorities and um, if, if that was one of them, I'm, I'm unsure. Okay, um, and would you suggest, therefore, that we ensure that um, some funding towards such a trial be included in our discussions around the 10-year plan next week so that we are in a position to fund something should you be able to get agreement on what? The funding decisions are for council to make next week during deliberations, councillor. It's fine. I'm just running the flag up the pole. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Risha. I have a question around um, page 94, where the ORC have a number of performance measures, and in those they've got numbers on a few of them, and then they've got some that just say increase, and I just uh, um, wonder if there's been any feedback to them about what targets we feel would be good, especially linking back to they have um, in there, on page before, uh, an objective to improve environmental health, and I don't see any measures around that, around their carbon zero aspirations. The opportunity to give feedback on the plan is this. Excellent. So, how would we frame, how would we uh, do that? By including it in our submission on the draft regional public transport plan. So do we move something to uh, to include that in the submission? Uh, yeah, in due course, if people if people want to make amendments to the plan, uh, I'd encourage them to write them. Uh, in advance of getting to that, but like that would be, you don't have to do it now, is what mm. I'm saying. Don't, okay. don't, don't rush, um, but we can get to that in, uh, in due course. And my second question is um, around page 128, when we're talking about process roles and responsibilities, number four, where it says the DCC seeks the transfer of Dunedin's public bus <coughs> services from the ORC to the DCC to improve transport solutions and further progress Dunedin's ambition to be zero carbon by 2030. And I wondered if we might ask for them to include it in their plan. Because we say, we say that we're seeking to do it, but we don't necessarily say that we would like it by a certain date or what, what we want them to do about it. Not sure that's Unclear a question, question of staff. Okay, counselor. not a staff question. So I, I guess I have a staff question around the um, the loop bus. Just wondering how much DCC staff input was put into that report. Uh, that was a joint ORC DCC um, commission report, councillor. Because I, I just really have a question about why Spates and Emerson's are included as destinations when it sort of looked to be a tourist bus and not something like Alveston. Yeah, good question. I mean, the team just traversed a number of options to give council some um, ideas about the scale and cost of such a service. Um, if it was to be adopted by DCC or ORC, there'd be further work required to uh, land on the specific route. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. On the loop bus, um, reading the information there, I almost felt like it was a tourist bus, you know, hop on, hop off at key areas like, um, you know, the museum, the different, as I think Councillor Barker's sort of so maybe indicated there. But so my feeling is, is it, uh, I feel we really need two loop buses going at the same time. One that's, you know, a commuter bus for the people who are at, say, at a transport hub, because regularly in this it talked about 
an area maybe where we could have a pickup. Well, a transport hub, wouldn't it be perfect for that sort of thing? I think it's, it's worth highlighting That's quite a good here. question, I thought. It's not a question at all. It of, is a question. Of staff, no. I, I, in the submission itself, it speaks to the idea that we are suggesting to the Regional Council, as part of their review of the public transport plan, that they look at what a, cent what a bus loop might look like as it, as it would be integrated into the wider public transport network. That is the submission. Appended to the submission are examples of feasibility works done around some particular examples. But the, the submission itself isn't asking them to do anything in particular beyond consider planning one and integrating it as part of the public transport network. Right. Well, my concern is that if we don't state clearly what we think is needed, we might miss out, you know, and end up with a which will be good, but perhaps more just a tourist bus that I think would be great because I used to get on and off them in London all the time, the double-decker buses. Council, the agenda is substantial today. Do you have a question of staff? Well, yes, I did have a question, but you um, shut me down again, like you do all the time. And I thought it was a very good question, Your Worship, around the benefits of a transport hub because it regularly talks in here about how a loop bus would work because really a loop bus, the purpose of that is to cut down commuters and they're travelling around with the cars or, you know, in all our streets. Therefore, it's something that I know you're keen on cutting back on cars. If we have a transport hub, we could have an area where people could get picked up. So Councillor, they park the car and get picked up there. Councillor, there'll be plenty of time in debate for you. To I realise that and I'm ready for it. However, it is a valid question. Are there, are there, are there subsequent. Does anyone else have questions? Ugh. Councillor O'Malley. You Worship. Uh, my questions are not so much on the submission but on the mechanism by which we got to this point of writing our submission and the role that Connecting Dunedin has played and, and the communication between the Otago Regional Council and the Dunedin City Council in getting this document um, out. Do you, can you tell me how many times the Reg OIC um, have approached DCC transport staff over the original design of this original consultation document? So I can't, I can't remember the specific number. It was um, OSC have communicated with staff directly since November, October, November of last year on a number of occasions. If that's, I'm not sure the specific number. I guess then, I guess a number is probably, okay, I'll, I'll rephrase this another way. On the Connecting Dunedin agenda, and, and action items that have come from Connecting Dunedin, to what extent has, has the um, RPTP actually been an agenda item and, and considered to be something that we've acted on? Uh, <clears throat> we can find that out, Councillor, but um, I don't recall the RPTP being on any recent Connecting Dunedin agenda. Councillor is a member of that group and knows what's on the agenda. I'm not sure that those minutes are public um, items and therefore when I speak to it I would just like to have asked a couple of questions during the question phase. That's fine. You, you can speak to the adequacy or otherwise of engagement but I don't know if that's a fair thing to ask of staff. Oh well it's just that how else do we get the information as to what was on the agenda into the public when that's not a public meeting and, and therefore how would anybody who's not attending that meeting... You can, you can speak to it in yeah. debate. Well, now well, I've pretty much raised yeah. it at this point. Um, <laughs> um, and do you know the extent to which, once this consultation process closes, we as a city, the DCC, would be able to have an influence on any outcomes that happen in public transport until the next RPTP is written? Is this effectively, when it goes in, and becomes the adopted document, then that is, because it's an ORC document, it for us, is that correct? Uh, well, Council will have the opportunity to speak to the submission if they choose, that, that'll be another um, opportunity to provide comment, uh, and then it'll be back to how we have been operating for the last three years in collaboration with ORC staff and councillors. 
you remember, are you, can you tell us how long, how much time was given between the RPTP being released for consultation and submitting back to it? Uh, three weeks, that's my recollection. Three weeks, thank you. Are you going with your amendments, Councillor Barker? A pair of exhausted questions. Thank you, Your Worship. I did see that there was some um, mention of carbon zero in our submission. Um, I s I'll still work on the other. Oh. I would like to move the submission as it's currently drafted. Moved by Councillor O'Malley, seconded Councillor Elder. Anything left to say, Councillor? If you look at our submission, it. Um, it, I think it addresses a lot of the questions that, are, that, <coughs> that relate to what we want to say on the regional public transport plan. Um, and of course, it, then it has more, more defined submissions around what a circular bus may look like. I, the real commentary I want to make here, and it was, it was answered in that very last question that I asked, this is, this is a plan that actually is very important for the Dunedin City Councils public integrated transport outcomes. And for only a three week gap to occur between the plan coming out and to get a response back in, I think was too short a notice. It has been my impression that our staff have not been actively engaged to the extent to which they could have influenced the writing of this plan. And the whole purpose of the Connecting Dunedin meeting system is that we're supposed to be integrating our works programs for good outcomes. And I do believe that Ms Benson's recollection of the Connecting Dunedin agendas and minutes is that, that, it, that it has been mentioned, but it's only been mentioned. It has not been a significant part, and there has not been a significant work program put together. And I guess in much the same way that I felt that the regional land transport plan had not used the technical advisory group properly, and to make a good plan there, as it could have. I feel that our regional public transport plan has used the Dunedin City Council's um, transport team less than it did in the RLTP. And that, in fact, we are getting a plan written by the ORC for what we need based on what they think we need, as opposed to whether or not we've actually communicated clearly our hopes and ambitions and desires. Um, so. I really go back to the point that we are saying that on point four, we seek the transfer of the need in public transport system over to the DCC. I really want to emphasise that point. I think that this can't go on much longer. The RPTP is a good example of the poor communications going on between the two organisations. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, I agree with um, Councillor O'Malley's comments. Um, I feel that as a council we've been ambitious with a lot of our goals around transport, some of them I haven't always agreed with, but one of them that I thought was particularly good was the loop bus, and I feel now that unfortunately we have little say except for making a submission um, to this plan on how, what we get for a loop bus, and because ORC seem to be the ones who are running it, we really need to see the ambition that we have in this plan, and I don't think it's here. And I have concerns that we could end up with a, a tourist bus that stops off at, at say, the museum, St Paul's Cathedral, um, maybe the Octagon, a few other hot spots like that, which is great. Don't get me wrong, I think that's awesome. I think it'd be a good addition to our city. I think we should have one. However, I think we need another loop bus, so we'd need two at least um, going. And to be effective, a commuter bus needs to be running regularly, every five minutes. That's the way they do in the city and in other cities around the world. And the whole purpose is that if you want to encourage people to get out of their cars, you've got to make it easy for them. So if we have a transport hub, which there's no mention of anything like that in here, um, where people could get picked up by the bus, the loop bus, if it came their way, but in an ideal world, if the loop bus stopped there, picked up where people parked their car, 
picked them up, took them around to the central city because the businesses are crying out for someone to take some action here and to bring people into the city. To We always talk about we want a, um, a thriving city. We've just talked about that. We're not going to have a fr- thriving city if we can't get a people around the city. This is a continual problem, and I do not feel that this plan is ambitious enough or looks at the problems we have. For example, I I have a, a daughter who started busing, so I'm sharing some of the busing concerns at the moment, and I would not be happy with my daughter being at that transport hub, there are the bus hub. There is a lot of... Um, you know, violence going on. I know ORC can't be held responsible for people beating each other up at the bus hub. However, more action needs to be taken on this because right now a lot of parents don't feel it's safe. And, uh, you know, these are things that need to be addressed for people to feel comfortable busing. I certainly wouldn't want to go in and out of that bus hub myself. So, you know, we've got our key uh, thing to help transport is our, our loop bus, This is not being addressed properly in this report, in my opinion. We need to change it, and I hope we have an amendment on that to make sure. But the trouble is we've got no power. We can make a suggestion or submission, but we've got no power on the decision ORC makes on that. Our hands are tied at every corner we look at around public transport. And I don't know, if we took over the buses, would we do a better job? I don't know. But something has to change because there does not seem to be uh, a good working relationship here around shared goals to achieve these things. But personally, I would love to see a transport hub that deals with expensive electric bikes, so somewhere where you could park those up, somewhere where you could have perhaps short-term car rentals, you could rent a car for an hour in and out like they have overseas, and somewhere to park your car. We need more areas to, you know, right now there's a real shortage of parking in our city. I know some people will dispute that, but I believe that's the case. This isn't addressed in any of this report, as far as I can see, and yet it's looking at transport for our city. You know, too much is missing, in my opinion, so I won't be supporting this. Councillor Marker. Can I just quickly ask a process question about moving an amendment? When would be the time to do that? Do it now, if you like. Ah. I would like to move an amendment, please. Um, Just a second that we um, add to number four to have immediate discussions over transferring Dunedin's public bus services to the DCC by 2024. Do you have this? Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm just turning the text into... And I'd just like to comment, or say, that um, this would be very... Hold hold on. Okay. So, so once we have it, mm-hmm. uh, someone will need to second it, and then uh, we'll debate the amendment uh, and vote on the amendment before going resuming debate on the substantive submission. Well, we'll see. Sure. This would be an additional sentence in paragraph four of the draft submission.
Second. Councillor O'Malley, would you speak to it, Councillor? I don't. I don't want to do this by committee if I can at all avoid it. Councillor Backer. I have um, requested that this be added in because I think that if we're looking at an integrated transport strategy that this is one of the most sensible ways to go. We've been um, quite vocal on transferring the bus or requesting that we have the bus services transferred over. So it seem a lot easier when we talk about things like the bus loop, etc. cetera. Um, and I'd encourage people to support it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can support this up until a point. The, the nervousness I have with the, the amendment as drafted is setting a concrete deadline for it, uh, just mostly because I don't know, I just don't know if it's possible when we're setting ourselves up to fail because there will obviously be contractual uh, arrangements and otherwise that would need to be worked through. And in the first instance, um, the, we need the support of at the, both the regional uh, government and the territorial authority uh, to transfer the, transfer the services full stop uh, and would be more comfortable um, ending with services uh, that would allow us a greater flexibility to have that, have that discussion. Um, and I don't want to vote against this because I, think it's, uh, because I think it is important and it's time that we got on with at least having that conversation. That's okay. I'll move that we adjourn the meeting for five minutes. Seconded, Councillor Gary. Those in favour? Those against? That's agreed.
the support of the mover and the seconder, I assume. Yeah. I refer the speakers to the amendment. Councillor Reddick. More of a question, but I don't know who would answer it, but I thought this, the ownership of public transport was mandated by government that it has to be with the regional authority rather than the city authority. It's just ownership isn't mentioned in the amendment as drafted. Okay, management. So you're saying management different management of the service can be transferred from the regional authority to the territorial authority with the mutual support of both levels of government. As of well, a year or so ago, when they changed the red, the Land Transport. Management Act, or whatever the relevant legislation was. Yeah. We had management, and they had. Oh, I'm, I'm taking speakers on the amendment. <coughs> Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. Um, changes in the Local Government Act, I think, is actually what allows it to happen now. Land Transport Management Act still has this statement in there about they must um, instead of may. Um, th the purpose of this amendment, I believe, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the mover, I'm the seconder, is, is that. We have for a long time talked about cooperative design and other such things and, and it has not necessarily come to fruition to the output outcome that necessarily has worked well with us. But I think the real issue is it's almost strange that when we <coughs> are the road controlling authority and every other component of the transport system is operating through the Dunedin City Council, the, the public transport system for the Dunedin City Council, which is entirely inside our boundary is operating in another council. So it's not so much a commentary on the ORC versus the DCC, but really bringing the activity inside the one institution, I think, is one aspect of it. If we were to, if the ORC was to agree that this was a good idea and we were taking over public transport, would the buses change and would things change dramatically? A lot wouldn't, because in fact, a lot of this is still under the Land Transport mm -hmm. Management Act. Councillor, I, I, the, 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 the comments around the transfer of the bus service are made in the substantive submission. The, the amendment really just speaks to giving direction about having the conversation. And so I okay, think fair enough. Okay. The difference would be, no, that this is, this is saying we are seriously wanting to do it as opposed to we think it'll be a good idea. Okay, fair enough. That's good. Councillor, Councillor Reddick, you've spoken to the amendment. We are speaking to the amendment which is uh, enlarging, effectively enlarging upon what was already in the submission around the desire to transfer the bus service to having that conversation, basically, is the, is the addition. Councillor Houlihan. Uh, I will support this because I think there can be no harm in talking. And I think for the two CEOs to chat, to try to work out where there's mutual agreement and um, I think at the end of the day, the public deserve things to improve. And right now, I don't think we're getting the bus service that we could have. But, I mean, I don't think we can put our hand up here and hold our hand to our heart and honestly say, if we take it over, we can do a better job, because I don't know whether we can. But something needs to happen. And I think it needs to be treated with some urgency, because right now, we're making plans and goals for our city, and they are tied and restricted by the fact that another organisation runs the public transport that affects so many things that we want to do. So it's crazy. The legislation doesn't seem to work well with, with the way we run our city. So I think something needs to change. Thank you. We have three speakers in support of the amendment. Are there any speakers against the amendment? I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Thank you. Further speakers to the substantive item? Uh, well, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll Councillor Reddick. Yeah. Uh, speakers to the item or questions? Well, I'd quite like to make an amendment to uh, suggest that they look at a loop bus that uh, went straight through the octagon, so item six modified. Uh, option six, you know, loop six modified. But, so I'm talking to the the overall submission. Rather so point twenty five. The DCC recommends a free city centre city loop bus be trialled, and include consideration of a, uh, a modified option six. 
the amendments you want a very specific option included as to what we are offering them to consider as part of their wider transport network? We've commissioned a study that has eight options. No, councillor, yes. that's what. So you want the submission to reflect not not just a specific option, but a, a specific option that isn't included in the appendix. Yes, to, it would ought to also consider a modified. You option. draft that in a in a way that we could consider it and send it through to Ms. Adamson. Have, have you looked at point twenty five on one thirty one, councillor? That's not. In my view, it would also be that it's covered by the submission. But if the if the councillor wants to make an amendment, he is welcome to propose one. Are there other speakers to the submission? I, uh, in, in speaking to this, it's become increasingly clear to me that the city requires uh, an effective and an attractive and a functioning uh, public transport system, and that, that's critical not just to our <coughs> environmental well-being, as has been canvassed, but also our, our social well-being in terms of uh, who is included and who has access uh, within and around the city. And I don't agree that. Um, to use the staff's words, students in particular should be the focus of that. There are plenty uh, of communities um, within our city who would benefit from reduced barriers to access uh, of the public transport system. And, and the, the, you know, the, the B card has been fine, uh, and it's a, it's a step in the right direction. It's still unfortunate that it meant that short trips uh, for some passengers remained more expensive and that they were uh, sacrificed in the interests of um, simplicity. Uh, and this is the opportunity, uh, given that that uh, ex uh, expires in June, this is the opportunity for us to uh, fix that or, or be more ambitious around that. And I welcome the, the comments that have been made around making it a dollar or making it free or trialling these things and, and, and seeing what impact that would have on, on, on patronage. Um, because and to, and, you know, the transport network as a whole is the single greatest thing we have as local government direct influence over in terms of reaching our zero carbon ambitions. And we aren't going to do that uh, without making uh, public transport uh, more attractive. I, I, I want to note the, how significantly improved the current regional public transport plan is uh, based on those that went before it. It was a, it was a big step. Uh, in terms of how the how the system functions, uh, and 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 I personally was looking forward to seeing what was going to be offered by way of building on that, uh, and and similarly in the conversations that have been had recently around council's position around transferring uh, governance or management or whatever the language is uh, between the two authorities, I was reserving judgment essentially until we saw what their draft uh, regional public transport plan uh, proposed uh, and the. The lack of ambition that is expressed in this document has done little uh, to persuade me that this, um, that the course of action suggested in our, our submission uh, is the right one. Um, there are a number of, uh, of options that could have been explored, whether they were express services or weekend services or dealing with existing capacity constraints that the, the, uh, the, the regional council are well aware of at peak commuter times, both for workers and for school children, that remain unresolved uh, by this. Um, their, their insistence on sticking with the fare box recovery rate, which was a, a relic of uh, previous um, governments in terms of how public transport is funded, that is no longer required. Basically, the guidance says, set it at a level that best meets uh, the, the aspirations and outcomes that your community is focused on. Uh, and, and what is being proposed here uh, does little to shift the dial beyond uh, what what they previously uh, inherited. Um, it's disappointing that we won't have uh, any involvement in the hearings around the regional public transport plan. The, the council, city council were allowed to delegate uh, someone, and, and full disclosure, I had that uh, enviable task uh, in the last cycle, but uh, it was really helpful having someone, uh, having input from this authority into the decision making that was being made around the regional public transport plan, and that again is a, is a missed uh, opportunity. Uh, but as is always the case, the argument around governance hinges for me on two things. One is um, the, the ambition of the, of the current governors, uh, and that's been well canvassed, and the other is, as has been pointed out, the, the, the value in terms of trying to plan and manage an integrated transport network with 
uh, one, arm, one arm tied behind your back basically when you don't have any direct influence over how public transport operates and it was disappointing the lack of input that, I can't speak to the, the conversations that staff have had, but certainly the lack of input that elected members were able to have in the early thinking around uh, how the, the draft regional public transport plan was. Uh, being prepared. I would prefer if we had a collaborative model to not have to have this uh, debate in quite such the manner that we have had to have today, but these are the options that are presented to us because this is the only mechanism we have uh, to give feedback into, into a document that we weren't asked for feedback on and it's uh, more uh, formative stages and, 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 to, you know, and likewise uh, per our submission to the Regional Council's 10-year plan, yes, the draft RPTP speaks of trialling things and testing ideas, but there is no budget uh, over the next 10 years uh, within the Otago Regional Council to do any of that work. And if there's no budget set aside for them to do it, one does wonder uh, how they would anticipate going, uh, going about it. Um, I, I don't know where this conversation um, is going to land, but it's long overdue that we had the opportunity to have it. Um, but you know we are running out of time to plan a public transport <coughs> system that is appropriate for the ambitions that the city has, both environmentally and socially. And I, I welcome the urgency uh, around this and the opportunity that it may present to us uh, to be a little more ambitious rather than waiting another five years for the next cycle uh, of, of uh, regional public transport planning. Further speakers? Councillor Wiley? Um, thank you. Um, I also would agree with the Mayor that uh, it has, does lack some ambition. But at the same time, I think the ORC have come quite a ways with the public transport, um, yet slowly at times. Um, but I do applaud what they've done, for example, in, for the Peninsula community and how staff have adjusted and actually improved the service and enhanced it for the residents on the peninsula, especially the school children that had so many frustrations and troubles getting to school. Um, so in all, I, I, I can basically support the submission. Um, there's areas of that that I don't 100% agree with or I think is pretty soft. Uh, for that reason, I'll be uh, hopefully putting a late submission in today that uh, they will accept, since they're happy to accept the DCC's late submission, so fingers crossed on that. I also find it a little bit um, crazy, uh, you know, again, you know, the Regional Council are busy submitting on their region 10-year plan and doing this at the same time. I think there's so many overlaps, I would have thought there would have been a little bit more separation between some of the consultation, but thank you. Councillor Reddick, your amendment is... It is uh, just a, in addition to yes, paragraph 25 that we also ask they consider a Route 6B that transits straight through the octagon. And shall I speak about that or not? Well, is there a second of your amendment? Second of Councillor Wiley? You can speak to it, Councillor. So, uh, and the reason for this, this makes it the quickest possible loop around the centre of town. It's just another uh, element to consider. Uh, as for the ORC, if they, you know, as they presumably take seriously the concept of the loop bus, but uh, as we can see from the table on page 225, it makes a very cost-effective trial, and uh, with uh, with just using two buses, they can get round the limit, round the. Um, I expect that they would get round that loop in about 12 minutes, so it's relatively low capital cost, and would make it a very easy starting point and they could from there easily add in the loop around the Polytech to get more uh, Polytech students using the loop if they chose to expand it. Uh, the critical thing with this route, uh, it would uh, go a long way towards uh, assisting shoppers moving up and down the length of Princess Street from the Exchange to Albany Street. Uh, for shopping up and down George Street if people are working in an office building and quite possibly in an office building in Dowling Street where there is no parking they could jump on the loop bus and get around 
and similarly at some future date it could tie in with a transport hub if one was to be built uh, somewhere with uh, car parking on the edge of the CBD and uh, this route could be easily uh, modified or even go straight past uh, some inner city car parking on the edge of the CBD and thus decongest the inner city further and increase the convenience of use of the loop bus because to me convenience is king when it comes to public transport and the um, the guiding text that Waka Katahi use when considering public transport is better buses better cities and that is the recommended reading <coughs> and the the overriding philosophy is convenience so fast frequent reliable and so in the um, assessment of the eight or the two assessments to make eight different loop buses they do talk a bit quite a bit about frequent and frequency and reliability but speed is also of the essence so having a transit down one length of the loop uh, on the one-way system would considerably speed up the transit time of anyone going anywhere on the loop so for instance a student could choose the loop bus going in the direction that they desire to get them George Street more quickly or to the exchange quickly so it, it does build a lot of flexibility into that loop bus if it's um, if it's if the transit time is short so hence the amendment Councillor Benson Pope thank you um, your worship well if anyone ever wanted a demonstration of a lack of understanding between the difference between governance and operational decisions there it is um, no one here will be in any doubt about my support for this proposal. In fact, most of you will recall that I tabled the notice of motion that made it council policy to investigate a trial of such a route. But I don't believe it is the role of this group and this forum to start devi devising the routes themselves. I think it's entirely inappropriate. Uh, and while I'm very supportive of the concept of such a bus, I am not the transport expert or the person, and I'd suggest that no one in this room is, certainly around this type, part of the table, to actually do the route design. So I won't be supporting much in all as I support the concept and hope that we can get a trial out of this current process. I don't support doing the route design at this forum. To the speakers, Councillor Elder. Thank you. Um, I actually think, um, again, like David Benson Pope, we do need to consider this route as part of the larger picture of trials. And that is because, in fact, in the 10 year plan feedback, there was a huge number of people who mentioned accessibility as a huge issue for them along George Street and even accessing the octagon. So. I, I support the idea of the trials, I support the idea of um, this route in particular and I look forward to seeing it as part of the trial process. So I support the idea but I support it as part of the trial process. And so it's not clear to me, Are you speaking, were you speaking in support of or against the motion, the amendment? Um, against the amendment. That's fine, that's all I need to know. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Following up from David Benson Popes. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll be very brief. I'd written down here before um, the, the councillor to my right had even spoken. This is, this is an, an operational decision. It's not for the governance team to make this decision. It's counter to point 25 um, of, of our submission. I think, Councillor Lord, you pointed that out already. It's already well stated in there about the bus loop. And I certainly, as Again, mentioned by Councillor David Benson, but I'm no expert in how travel systems work, and I always would, will have done and will do defer those decisions to people who know what they're doing and what they're talking about. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, I, I, while I, I support the idea, <coughs> I think we do have to be careful we don't move into operational um, as governors. But I, um, I think something like this would be really suitable to go as a recommendation in a discussion. <coughs> you know, so if we get the vote passed that the CEOs meet and chat about <coughs> you know, the further future of our public transport, 
that something like this could be discussed in some me further meetings along the track because it's probably not seen as an urgent thing for each CEO to discuss the direction of the bus. But I do think <clears throat> if it's going to work, we have to have a really good route that, you know, does... And I've actually put another amendment as well, so it might be quite good to see that. And maybe I've gone into the lines of operation or I haven't intended to if I have, but um, if we could look at that, that would be good as well. We'll Thanks. get to that in due course. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll be voting against the amendment. I support what is already in the submission, which is point 25, to improve the access around the CBD, a centre city um, bus loop. That uh, encapsulates what I want to see. The detail will come after that. I don't want to presuppose what, what that might be and what it might look like, so I'll be voting against the amendment. Further speakers? Councillor Wiley. Um, I seconded this because I wanted to see where it would go and in listening to speakers around the table um, and looking at point 25 that everybody's referencing, I actually will support this all the way through because it is to consider a route. It's not telling them that's the route we want, it's not telling them what we are th uh, basically are dictating to them. It is about considering a route, and when we talk about uh, through a route, we talk about improved access around the CBD. I guess a lot of the feedback I'm wanting is people want access through the CBD, and I think this is what covers that off. Sir Melly, surprisingly, I will be supporting it for the reasons that some councils have talked about us not being operational and doing this, yet themselves have determined the shape of that loop when they first proposed it. So it's not like councillors haven't in the past said what they want to see in it, and it is actually just, please consider this along with the others. I don't think any of the relevant resolutions refer to a, a route in particular. It was always... Um, I do know that vague. in the debate it was said it would never go to South Dunedin, and it would never go here, it wouldn't go there. So by virtue of that... Well, things, things that are said in debate aren't quite the same as decisions that are taken by council. But are there further speakers? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? No. Okay, do it on a show of hands, please. Those in favour? Those against? Lost. Councillor Houlihan, you're up. Thank you, Your Worship. I've put this... I need to see, need to see all of this, yeah. for starters. My concern is it just gets to the... Yeah. Then what happens? Yeah. Oh, that's clear. You can look like that. You were a first termer at one stage. Your well, microphone is on, Councillor. Good. Why is that? Well, normally I would have talked to Claire, but Claire's not here, so I put through a draft in the hope we can work something that's suitable. That, well, I'm not not of a mind to, for us to sit around and workshop this. This is the amendment right, that we have Right, so uh, Council, can I speak Council, to this? No, you can't yet, uh, because it has been moved by Councillor Houlihan. Is, it, is there a seconder? It lapses for want of a seconder. 
We're back on the substantive, well, he says cautiously, are there other amendments that people wanted to raise at this point? No. We're back on the substantive debate. Are there further speakers to the submission? Councillor O'Malley, your right of reply. It's been so long. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, our submission covers a number of points, and I think we did get rather um, almost distracted in the loop bus, um, which I am replying to because of, of that. Um, to the actual, I really want to comment on the Mayor's comments and in and, and agreement. The amendment that did make it through into the final submission, I think, becomes the crux almost of the submission, because if you look at our submission, it's entirely based on what we want to see in the integrated transport of the city. And the key component of us delivering that right now is, in fact, the public transport. So I think, in many respects, I just really agree with what His Worship has said on, on the submission. Um, and. And I do want to acknowledge that the OIC has been trying and it is better than it was before. This is, and I really want to emphasise that this discussion about the transfer of ownership is not a direct criticism of the OIC, but, but, an acknowledge, but I would hope that both councils can acknowledge that having this activity in a council over here and this council over here is doing anything else is just straight out inefficient. And if we can go along those lines, I think that would be the most constructive way to go forward. Um, <laughs> Um, and will, the, will it be better when it comes to us, if, if that is the outcome? There are still outside constraints that affect the ability of delivery of a good public transport system, and that's the Land Transport Management Act and the public transport operating model, which are outside of our control. But if we have the system inside our council, we can then start addressing those externalities, and hopefully we can get it improved from there. Thank you very much, and I hope that we all vote yes on this. Thank you. Uh, I will put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? No. Recorded, please. That is agreed. Thank you. I will move that we adjourn for lunch until quarter past one. Second of Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you.
Gentlemen, we're on to item 14. COVID-19 support fund update. Mr. West is on his feet. Questions, councillors? <clears throat> Here to be none. Okay, anyone like to move the recommendations? Councillor Wiley? Happy to move. Is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Hall. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Further speakers? Oh. Councillor Elder. Um, I think what the DCC did and what the Council did in, in promoting a recovery opportunity through council funds was a really, really good idea. Um, and as noted in the report, there were other funds that people could apply to and other supports that were out there as well. Um, and I think the report covers clearly why not all of these um, funds were taken up, um, but I think the intent of supporting our community through a really hard time was, was um, <coughs> really important and messaging the right kind of things to our community at that time. Further speakers. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I, I agree with Councillor Elder that um, certainly there was a need for um, you know, for this grant and I think it was certainly a, a good idea at the time. However, what I would say is that right now there's possibly in some sectors even stronger need, even though we've had, you know, we, we live in, uh, in New Zealand where we are very lucky, obviously, compared to the rest of the world, but um, certainly in the arts sector particularly, a lot of people are still hurting because they're not, there hasn't been that constant um, in, income coming in from gigs and things, and I think, that, you know, any grant like this um, needs to benefit people who are really struggling, so particularly in the arts yeah. sector. And hopefully we'll get more pick-up on the Māori Innovation and Development Fund, and I applaud our... Um, oh, she's not here now, but... Um, our uh, kaifakahari hari Māori Māori, <laughs> who, who said... Sorry, um, I got that a bit confused who has put forward that that fund continues on a um, regular permanent basis and I think that's a great idea to um, offer some innovation funding and I hope that gets picked up. Thank you. Mr Wiley, the right of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? No, please. Thank you. Item 15. Our Three Waters Reform update, Mr Drew, Mr Dyer, welcome. <coughs> Anything from either of you? Questions, councillors? Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Benz, you'd be terrible at auctions. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a question around the, the language and definitions in these reports. Um, I've previously asked about um, exactly what public means, but I'm becoming increasingly nervous about the uh, repeated assurances about public ownership um, because, of course, well, um, we're all only too familiar with the fact that the electricity industry uh, in public ownership because it was sold to the public. Well, that ain't public ownership as far as I'm concerned. Do we have any flesh on the bones of what that repeated promise actually means? My question clear? You know, pu sorry, public ownership for me is ownership by public institutions not individual members of the public. And that's, I see no light around any definition in the documents. I think that would be, um, 
that would be fair. The definition and the conversation around ownership is, um, uh, the, I guess, the definition and the, the structure around that is growing. The more and more we hear um, uh, DIA proposing um, uh, ownership structures that don't include the word ownership. So, for instance, they use the um, they use uh, analogies like um, who owns DIA. Um, uh, the idea being that um, the entity would have no ownership and would be a crown entity. That fills me with comfort, thank you. We would anticipate a definition in the drafting of the Water Services Entity Bill when that sees the light of day. We would expect that <coughs> to come in the latter part of this year. <coughs> Councillor O'Malley. Your Worship. Um, sort of getting to that question and looking at the structures, and I'm looking at page 124 of our report, which was, I don't know, was it? Anyway, it's 124 of our report. You're looking at some of the structures and then 123 of, of what I think, I mean, I've, these are PowerPoint slides, so I'm not sure what the commentary goes with it, but um, what I think is the structure of the water services entity boards, and then there's other commentary through there where it effectively says that the board will be made up of professional directors. And yet the feedback in above is either mana whenua and local authorities pointing down, and then in other parts of the document it says the board itself will be made up by professional directors. Do you, I believe you were at one of these presentations, do you know what they were saying with those slides? So lots of the detail is still not there. What, what I heard from the presentation was um, a, a group of governors that sit above the board and appoint the board uh, and have a statement of a tent type relationship and then the board um, implements and, and has governance and makes sure that that is occurring sort of in the way that a board of governors called a council would work through a statement of intent to a board of a council controlled organisation? Not quite. And the, I mean, and these are all hypotheticals <coughs> at this point, but one of the key tensions in the work at a, in terms of governance and, and control, if you like, or the spectrum of control, is satisfying the requirements for balance sheet separation. Um, and which gets increasingly more difficult the more influence people wish to have directly over the entity, whatever they end up looking like. And so that is uh, one of the, the pivotal conversations that, the, that they're working through at the moment is <clears throat> how to balance those, that tension between um, community input or community control or influence over these entities and, and the requirements of balance sheet separation that the individual or well, the current asset owners would be required to have. So if that's the case then would those letters of um, expectations and statement of intent be more or less powerful than with the CCO? Because at least with the CC, I mean with the CCO you've got the balance sheet and now that balance sheet is even being removed even further away from parties of interest. I guess my question is related to when these entities form how much control will the local authorities have over their behaviour, um, given that we know how much control we have over CCOs? It's a very good question, uh, and it's not one that anyone is able to answer at this point. I think so. That would be the fair answer, would it not be that at the moment we don't really know <coughs> we where don't that's know going? Until, until we see the legislation, or, or at least an exposure draft of that, and I can't imagine we'd be able to give them any more informed view on it. Um, I want to go to the Morrison Lowe report and it's page um, 171 to start with. It's just something I noticed in there which doesn't make sense. Um, so this is about Otago and Southland and their different authorities and the water they have in it. And on page 171 they have water connections per kilometre and you notice they have Perth District has 3.1 water connections per kilometre according to this. And then when you go up a little bit you get the populations of the towns um, 
and Clutha the district is 6, 000, um, has 18,000 people and we have 134,000. If you do a simple calculation, according to that, Clutha the district would have more pipes in the ground than Dunedin. Is that likely? So more, more kilometres. They predominantly run rural schemes which um, connect to multiple farms and have a very long length of pipe per customer. If you then go to the next figure two, which is on page 172, <coughs> and Clutha has 32 wastewater connections per kilometre. Uh, that's also correct. So they, uh, they service their townships for wastewater, but not their rural areas, um, but they service a large area, a large proportion of their rural areas with a water service. Um, it's just a function of um, where, the serv where services are provided or not. Okay, so, yeah, because I come up with um, 1,900 kilometres for Clutha, we'd have 1,200. Is that, I mean, what, what's, our, what's the size of our reticulation system? Uh, off the top of my head, it's around around 1,300 kilometres. Okay, so yeah, I just did population divided by three to get the number of connections. So, so Clutha District actually has 700 kilometres more <coughs> freshwater pipes than us. I couldn't be 100% sure, but I know they have a vast length of pipe network. Also one of the longest building networks in the country. <coughs> well, I guess the reason is that because it, it, it becomes a big written section in that, in that report about what these councils are facing. And, and it just seems strange to me because it was Waitaki District included that they highlighted and saying that they'd be facing enormous amounts of cost because such low levels of connection per such incredibly long levels of pipe. But, you, but that is in fact the case that they do actually have that level of reticulation system. Cool. Well, that came as a complete surprise to me. Um, um, page 176 on that same, or oh, page 176, which is on that report. It has um, percentage of renewals, uh, figure six, um, as percentage of depreciation, and um, Dunedin going into the future is sitting above the target at 100% line, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Now is that based on this commentary in the, in the text about asset valuation and other such things, is that that is based on our asset valuation and then what we'd be expecting to spend on a, some asset renewal program, right? It's based on our asset valuation for the uh, 1920 year. The 2021 year asset valuation is just working through approvals at the moment and finalisation at the moment, but does show a reasonably significant uplift. So that graph will need to change in time. And when you say reasonably significant, will that be like a doubling or...? Yeah, around that. About Dublin, okay. Because then I want to go down to page 179, and we're talking about plan renewals investments. Um, and again, DCC stands out there because it, it says in that table that assets with less than 10 years life remaining is 1.2 billion. Yeah, that's also correct. So we uh, we typically use an estimation of useful life for, for our drainage assets of around 100 years. Um, there is a good proportion of our drainage assets that are older than 100 years. Um, so therefore, you end up with a um, uh, with quite a big number. Now, the other that you, the, the important thing is to remember that that's an academic exercise. Um, the the next step is to condition assess and to measure performance. Um, which we also do quite actively. Um, just because an asset's old doesn't mean it's going to need replacement on, on its 100th birthday. Um, and so this, this table doesn't take that into account. Um, however, it does point to um, a significantly aged asset base. OK, so when you're looking at that column, you're not saying that we believe that those assets are going to fail within 10 years, but they are actually within 10 years, they're less than 10 years from what would be considered the end of life normal calculation. Yeah, that's I either they're very old, but we don't necessarily. That's know correct. Them. Yeah, but um, I guess it does point to a risk that further and failure rates may increase um, in the near term uh, as they continue to age. Because I'm looking then at our own 10-year plan investment, and we've got 396 million in renewals, um, and yet in that column we have 1.2 billion that are within 10 years of the end of life, by our assessments. So, 
are we anticipating then in the next 10 year plan that that number will have to go up? Uh, so in, each, in the development, development of each 10 year plan we work through um, uh, an assessment of theoretical useful life, an assessment of performance of our assets, an assessment of um, uh, a capital works program and then how deliverable that capital works program might be um, and balance all of those things. Um, the, it is reasonable to assume that um, as we continue to work through learning more about our assets and all that sort of thing um, towards the next LTP that we'll be coming back and asking for a little bit more. And just to clarify, these are our full three waters, right? So this is sewer, storm water and fresh water and drinking water. Correct. Cool. Um, oh well, what I'm going to say next is a comment, so we'll have to wait till later. Um, Very kind of you. Thank you. Um, one of the other comments, and I'm not sure what page is in, is that um, depending on depending on the size of your um, district and whether you're a metro or a rural, you'll get different. There's different expectations of the effects on rates. Um, where um, were this to be entirely put back on councils, and um, they be the only ones that that pay? It's come out of the DIA presentations. I believe in our area, for, for cities of our size, it was looking like around about a thousand dollars. Is that correct? There's a few different financial modelling scenarios, but yeah, that that sounds about right. Oh, one last question: Has DIA ever talked about a, another model? And I guess what I'll have to ask is to Mr. Drew. After three waters, would it be fair to say that transport is probably our next biggest capital spend area? Correct, transport is. And do we pay for that entirely by ourselves, or do we get central government assistance with that? Come on, councillor. <laughs> we get central government assistance through uh, Waka Katahi. And and there is no transfer of ownership of the asset. They're all questions you wish. Thank you. And the, but the, on the financial modelling point, um, a lot of it depends on where the boundaries of any entity end up being drawn or not, and which authorities end up opting in or opting out of any system or not. Um, so there's a, a fair degree of uncertainty around that modelling at this point, based on. To, to be, yeah, to, and that's, to be, that's why that'll have to be covered in the <coughs> speaking section. Um, but for Dunedin, as the Metro, as we sit right now, ish around a thousand dollars and I acknowledge that that is quite literally ish at this point. Thank you. It's a lot of ish in this uh, discussion so far. Councillor Houlihan. A lot of ish, I like that. Um, so about a year ago we had a workshop for the day with DIA around Three Waters and there was more questions than answers through that day and we were told that we would get the answers to those questions at some point. I, have we had the answers to those? I don't believe we have. Uh, I think over time some of the questions, uh, I think I remember the day you referred to, and some of the questions that we had at that time have um, begun, they've begun to um, put some more flesh on the um, on the proposals, however, um, there are still quite a few questions to come, and I expect that um, the we uh, those things should be clarified within the next three months. Right. Do you do you think that Friday will be perhaps a lot of answering a lot of those things, or is Friday announcing what's th that it's going ahead? I don't think it's fair us staff to comment on an upcoming DIA presentation. Right. Okay. No, that's fair enough. Um, what do we know, uh, you might not be able to answer this, so that's fine if I don't know who, do we know where there's, um, say for example, building works a lot with infrastructure, you know, in three waters, what will happen with a lot of those departments that we have in council that work, you know, really closely with three waters, like how will that work in if it's a different, you know, it's an independent or a public or who knows what will own it, something will own it, apart for us, um, under this new plan. How, any idea how that will work? 
Uh, that question was raised at a workshop in Wanaka recently. What DIA said there was they see it being no different to dealing with an Aurora or a telecom and that, that it already works for oh. those entities <laughs> and they expect it to be the same. Right, OK, some people would, might dispute that. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, item 20, and you may or may not be able to answer this, but I was interested to know, uh, we know that stormwater is still not necessarily um, in the reform, um, but discussions are going on, and I wondered what your sense was of the direction that that discussion is heading in. Uh, I think yet to land is the short answer. And certainly, there's certainly no consensus around councils around the country as to where that should sit either, uh, and, and whether or not um, there being a single definitive structure is going to work or not, uh, and whether and question, other councils are asking questions around whether you should be able to choose whether you get to keep control of your stormwater or not. But um, again, <coughs> still questions rather than answers at this point. Councillor Raddick. Um, um, a few things. Um, firstly, uh, right at the beginning, page 164, the executive summary, it says based on analysis of eight territorial authorities, yet there are 10 mentioned whether there were a couple did not, were there two authorities that did not supply answers, or is that just an error? The report's been prepared by Morrison Lowe, not, not our staff, so yes. they may not be able to answer questions around the methodology, but... Okay. Just curious. Yeah, so I didn't pick that up and can't find the specific reference, but I can answer that question afterwards. Yeah, I was just curious. I mean, there's 10 logos and there's 10 authorities in the area, but that's a minor thing. Um, and on the other facing page 165 of the Morrison Law Report, Three Waters Assets, Debt and Revenue Transferred to a New ent Entity. Oh, sorry, I can answer your question, Councillor. Two of those ten logos belong to regional authorities <laughs> who don't have water assets. But, uh, there we go. Thank you. Um, de assets, Debt and Revenue Transferred to a New Entity. So has that been uh, definitely signalled that the debt will be transferred as well? That's been the basis of discussions so far. Great, thank you. That, and that is, that, that's relevant to the earlier questions asked around um, control and ownership. So yes. there's a tension between, if they're taking the assets, we also want the debt the taken debt off to us. Go. That's right. but, but in order to make balance sheet separation work, you have to forego a degree of influence or control over the eventual entity. Well, it's how the debt is measured also, but however, that's in the detail, really. Um, we've got the second highest rate of water pipe burst in the region, page 180. 180. So over the course of this 10-year plan, we're doing quite a lot of renewals. Do, is it, do you expect the rate of water pipe bursts will decrease over that time? My uh, so at the present point, our trend is declining in terms of total water main failures, uh, and I'd expect that to continue given our investment. The, um, I, I guess there's no signalling from the potential new authority what they'll be doing about that either? <coughs> no. No. Um, where am I? Next one. I had a, a couple of more. Just, um, page one, two, two ten. Uh, stormwater. Uh, Dunedin's pollution event related to a discharge to an aquatic environment. That's down in the first sentence of the last paragraph on the page. Page two hundred ten. Uh, my, I guess that is discharge through. Lawyer's head, is that right? Uh, no. Uh, so over the last few years, um, we've had a number of uh, overflows from network collapses and those types of things. Um, but I believe the 
um, one of the serious pollution events was a diesel spill in South Dunedin that made its way into the, so it was at a private private commercial property that made its way into the uh, into the stormwater network and then onto the harbour. Right. But I have a recollection of that. Was there a prosecution for that? Uh, no, but it was reasonably well publicised at the time. So uh, any discharge from lawyers here is not included in that. Uh, so that's a, uh, a reasonable event. It's not a notifiable event or anything like that. Uh, it is a notifiable event, um, and we do have a discharge from lawyers here from time to time, but it's not considered a um, serious pollution event. Page 213, we've got nine roles that are currently vacant uh, in three waters. What impact is that having on the situation? Uh, so that was a point in time assessment when this report was being done. I believe it's down around six at the moment, and we normally, you know, through we have a hundred staff and through normal means of attrition, we normally have a few vacancies, but they're always always worked on being filled. Sure. Um, and unit rates on page two two two. So. The, our unit rates are quite high for all of the items mentioned. Uh, I suppose, firstly, why are they so high, and what difference will that make? That will, that, what difference will that unit rate differential make to the Three Waters reform package we're likely to get? Uh, so we've worked really. So we'll, sorry, the first thing to point out is the the unit rates you're referencing. Uh, um, uh, rates that come from our valuation. Um, now, in the last 12 months, we worked through an exercise to try and um, ensure that those valuation rates, um, the rates by which we value our assets, are, are keeping pace with the rates that we're paying the market to replace those assets. Um, uh, we've worked through that exercise uh, in, in a really robust way over the last 12 months. We're, we're just working through finalising that, but we use those new rates to um, uh, to educate this report. Um, they are significantly higher than our neighbours. However, our rates prior were down around the same level <coughs> as our neighbours. Um, on talking to our neighbours about those rates as well, they've also suggested they're seeing the same kind of uplift. They just haven't yet revalued their assets. Right. So, what difference? You know, because there's such a differential there at this stage, what will that difference? What will that differential make? What difference will that make to our likely three reform package? Because you're looking at asset value and debt and expense. Uh, it's too early to tell at this stage, I think. Right. Okay. Um, that will do for now. Thank Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm just I'm making the assumption that this entity will um, pay for our assets. Is that what we're thinking? Or do we know? Uh, I, I think it's still too early to tell what okay. that looks like. This is a lot of money, you know, obviously um, involved, so it is quite an important question. I'd imagine most councils would want to know. It is an absolutely um, critical question, but we don't have an answer to it. I know, yet. exactly. My other follow up would be I wonder if we've thought about if they are, hopefully, if this, even, if this goes ahead, um, but if they are buying those assets off us. Um, Will there be any, we don't know this I suppose, but my question is, I'm wondering whether there'd be any stipulation on what we have to do with that money. No idea. No, because also, will that mean that councils all of a sudden get a flush of a don't. whole lot of money and they'll all become really wealthy Cal and... Councillor, we don't know. No. I mean, they're all valid questions, but they're not ones that staff can answer at this point. No, okay. I was just wondering if we're going to get rich overnight if they pay us it. <laughs> Thank you. Not a gambling man, but <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Elder. Sounds promising. Um, I have uh, a number of questions. Um, 
First of all, um, Three Waters owns a lot of land um, that actually is used recreationally and um, I'm wanting to know whether this authority um, or this investigation it has <coughs> any views on land, land assets held by councils. Uh, so as we move towards reform, we'll be considering all of those potential land parcels, their recreation value and uh, the potential to leave them in, whether or not it makes sense to leave them in council ownership or and a water utility ownership and what caveats might come with that. Um, but that's a part of a separate work package and the answers for that will come in time. Do you see a risk in that transferring um, that, um, let's say, if people want access, it make, makes it very dif more difficult if it's um, within a, a, an institution that's um, far removed from um, local, the local community? Uh, I guess there's pros and cons for all scenarios there. Um, if you were talking about significant volumes of land, over 30,000 hectares, mm -hmm. um, which have a maintenance and upkeep cost, so if you could ensure that a utility were to maintain public access rights, um, that, and that, then that cost may be transferable to a new utility and it may be something that the council's happy with. Another option might look like um, uh, retaining council ownership of some land with um, uh, the ability of the utility to use it for uh, collection of water for the city. Um, but in that case you might be looking at a different cost apportionment and there's just a whole bunch of different um, things to work through there to make sure that we know where to make a wise decision. So you see the um, importance of um, in, in the process having public access rights written into the document? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, uh, apologies for the interjection, but we could spend a significant period of time today debating the pros and cons of various hypothetical permutations as to where this legislation might go and, and staff may be able to answer some of those things. Um, there will be a greater deg degree of clarity over time. I'm just um, suggesting that being a little more judicious with how we use this period of questioning of staff might be um, helpful, but carry on. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so. Um, a question is, um, do you believe um, that the current assessment in this report is a, a fair assessment of, of um, what we have in our three waters? Uh, largely, yes. And also a fair assessment of um, future costs um, in the sense of upgrading to current standards or, or new standards? It, it is the best information we have today, yeah. Um, my other question really is about um, capacity and um, a, a programme like this requires a lot of capacity and that, that means um, professionals who are uh, qualified to do this in the area. Do you believe that even New Zealand has the capacity to deliver such a big program. We're still to see the full scale of the program. This is the information that we have at the time, but uh, it, is a, it will be a challenge for the industry to um, work through the reform and deliver all the infrastructure upgrades that would be required. Thank you. Councillor Lopiso. Uh, tēnā koe, Your Worship. Um, thank you very much and acknowledgements to Mr Campbell for putting all this together. Uh, I think my question is for uh, His Worship more than anything else, anyone else because um, I know that when, when this was first canvassed um, to us uh, last year before lockdown I think maybe or 2019 um, from my, from my perspective, the concerns were localism and, um, you know, pricing of, say, int the introduction of water meters for domestic arrangements and, and the impact on um, our staff here. So, is, given Tomata otherwise already been set up, is local government New Zealand cut out of the picture in terms of 
local, advancing localism to any extent? Uh, local local government New Zealand have, appoint, this, have appointed membership to the Three Waters Steering Group, which is made up of Department of Internal Affairs officials and and, and um, people from the local government sector, uh, who have been working on almost full time working on um, this work as it evolves and, and the various iterations uh, of it. Um, but that's not the same as Algae and Z being directly involved in that work, and, and there are constraints around what the individual members of the steering group are able to say uh, openly, and so there isn't necessarily the degree of um, communication coming back out from that work that perhaps uh, the membership might have expected, but they certainly are uh, intimately involved in the work as it develops. But all of the... And all of the um, the questions you raise, again, um, entirely valid and as yet unresolved. As, as far as I'm aware, I'm not on the steering group, so I'm, I'm not as closely related to it as others are. Councillor Houlihan. If we still get no answers and, and or the answers we get, say on Friday, are ones we're not happy with, is it too late for me as to maybe even cluster together and say, we don't like this, we don't want to do it, what would happen then? Fundamentally the decision will be for individual councils as to how they wish to proceed with this work. So eventually the outcome will be, a proposal will be uh, on the table for us and every other territorial authority to decide how we wish to proceed. So as a council, if, say for example, we just didn't like you know, the proposals, if we said we don't want to do it, would an individual council be able to work? You might not be able to answer this, but I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, be yeah, to, a very good question. Yeah, be able to work what, with what that organisation or entity. Don't know. Um, this is probably a silly question, but will we still have an infrastructure department after this? Well, infrastructure is far yeah. broader than. Yeah. Well. Well, that. that's yes, but. Would we still have, say, three waters, but doing small, you know, or will they just take over everything that three waters does currently? Yeah, or, like what, I said earlier, we don't. We, we don't, don't know. know. But particularly right. as it relates to the stormwater network. Right. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. In terms of understanding what we are facing and the and the uncertainty around whether stormwater will be included in the reforms. Do we have a two waters calculation to go with the three waters calculation? No, we don't. In the absence of that, then, if it doesn't come down to being three waters, how are we going? What's our plan for understanding what the implication will be financially? This is my understanding is that. Uh, the intention of DIA is to present proposals um, to councils at the end of this financial year and I'd suggest that that proposal should include financials associated with it so if stormwater was not included um, you'd see clear indications of financials for a two waters model. But when we're, but we're not developing our own financial implications for, for, if, it be, for if it becomes two waters? Not yet. We've had some high-level discussions, but we haven't done any of the work. Councillor Elder. Um, I'm, I'm talking to um, localism, actually, and um, significance and engagement when it comes to the work this um, entity will do around Dunedin. And in particular, we have done a lot of work, ORC, DCC, and... Um, Genie Science and others around the future of South Dunedin, which is a very local and very high priority issue. Um, and I'm just wondering whether, in fact, um, that kind of engagement would possibly carry on under this kind of structure. Very good question. We don't know at this point in time. We don't know because we don't, and we don't know what this. We don't know what the structure is. <coughs> is it a question that there is an answer for, Councillor Houlihan? I don't know. 
If, say, for example, it ends up being two waters that this entity takes over and we're left with one water, the storm water, um, could that be a way that this entity could argue we can't buy your assets off you because you still need them to operate your storm water? Cunning, you see, I just thought of that now. Mm. <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. That's right. But, Thank you. Well, not really, it could be... <laughs> But the other thing it goes with, apart for paying off our debt as well, the same argument could stand if we've still got one water to deal with, that argument could come through on the debt and the asset buyback. Could it not? I'm just, I'm naive on the three waters as far as I don't understand the complexity of those infrastructures and how they work together, but I'd imagine some of those are similar to the other two in the way that maybe shared Thing. Would that be fair to say? And so, therefore, is, the, is, the, is your question, Councillor, <laughs> if I may be so bold, how in, how integrated is stormwater into the rest of the water network in terms of how difficult would it be to extricate it from the rest of the three waters work? Yes, that's a good question. <laughs> we could extricate it. What, what was that answer? We could extricate the, the oh, you could. and the, the management of those assets reasonably easily. Um, however, it would be a small team required to run a stormwater entity. And uh, so typically we lean on a number of multidisciplinary engineers uh, to cover all three waters. Um, yes. So we, we hire clever people that can do all three. Um, we would be challenged to manage a stormwater utility without the other two waters with it in terms of recruitment of staff, retention of staff, um, uh, and some of the finan financials that come with it. But it is possible to separate the books and to run the networks independently. And what, oh sorry, did you understand? I was just going to add that that is the model for Watercare and Auckland City Council. So Watercare run the water and the wastewater assets. and. Auckland City Council run the stormwater, stormwater system. So if there was, um, which we hope, I assume we're hoping, that we get paid for our assets, would then some of those assets still be being used by stormwater or not? Or you'd just have to, like, would they be shared? Or you're saying they could be completely separate? It's one of the complexities of stormwater, which is why it's sort of been parked in a hard basket in that uh, it's... That lots of the assets are also integral to the transport network. So the mud tanks, for example, collect the water and the road collects the water and then enters it into the stormwater system. Th those boundaries, uh, there is a working group that is trying to work through the complexity of stormwater and where is best sit. So we've got projects that say we're taking on in this 10 year plan that are large projects that one assumes this entity will take over the majority of those projects and we've put a lot of money into that, so they'll have to then pay us back for that, one hopes, is that the interconnectedness with, the, you know, I'm just trying to, it is, I can see complications there, but I understand you probably can't answer any of that, no. And us to prepare the current 10-year plan as if, under business as usual, and the timing as set out would suggest that the subsequent 10-year plan would be, um, if it continues on this trajectory, uh, it, it wouldn't be sitting within our 10-year plan by the 2024 year. Councillor Raddick. Um, and the Morrison Low Report has flagged a couple of concerns, I suppose, about our various systems. And I'm just curious about them, firstly, in freshwater. Uh, page 187, they flag that the cost of treating and supplying a cubic metre of water is much higher than in other councils. Is that simply due to evaluations or why is that? Uh, so yes it is much higher. Um, there's a couple of different reasons for that. One is um, we supply to a far greater volume of people. Um, so those costs are distributed across a wider range of people. Um, the If you look at the graphs that summarise the level of treatment that we provide um, in terms of complexity and safety. That's much higher than most of our neighbours. Um, comes at a cost. Uh, our storage levels are much higher than our neighbours. Comes at a cost. 
we also have um, the challenge of managing a, um, a city utility in a very steep topographical environment, um, which again adds a bit of cost to those figures. However, um, it's not disproportionate with the rest of the country or cities with similar um, challenges. And they also talk about resilience with um, having a single source of water. Do we have a plan for that? Uh, I didn't see a reference to that. We, we do have a broad range of water sources. Yeah, there's um, other reservoirs. And it's a reasonably high degree of resilience. Right. Hey, um, in the stormwater, they identify the 11,000 properties, presumably of South Dunedin, that uh, mentioned that a couple of times. Do we, what's our plan for the stormwater resilience for South Dunedin? Uh, in, in terms of how, I'm just curious, how, how does it relate to, how does that question relate to this paper? It might uh, affect how they consider our asset transfers. How might it? I'm curious, I'm just. Well, that the um, additional costs that the new authority might face. Oh, is your question, possibly being included. What, is our, what is our work program, what implications does our work program have for a new entity? Yes. Don't know. Okay. Any, answer, any answer to that would be it would have a lot of assumption in it. Um, I think the short answer is we're not sure. Um, and just a question on the wastewater. There's a lot of uh, significant pipes of unknown material. Is that due to the number of private installations in the city? It's probably a curiosity question. On page 237, they flagged that. Some councils. And the last, the very last line on that page of 237, just unknown material in the wastewater pipes. But I was just curious if that's due to the large number of private developments that have taken place over the years, and we don't know what they are. What uh, the are. Some some of our records are, um, are unclear on the material um, of certain pipe work and certain parts of our um, network, and this is largely down to. Uh, the record keeping of um, smaller councils prior to amalgamation. Um, in some cases, it makes sense to go out and work out what that material is. In other cases, less so. You can infer from the surrounding um, surrounding pipework and all of that sort of thing. So we're reasonably comfortable with the level of information we've got at the moment is appropriate for the types of work that we do. Um, but we do endeavour to collect that information where the opportunity arises. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. I'm just following up on a question that Councillor Houlihan said. It's around um, minimum um, effective size and capability. And when, in terms of um, specialist, specialist staff, you made a comment that at the current time, with the three waters all inside our water department, we, we use cross capabilities sometimes to service some areas. So could there be a perverse outcome here <laughs> that if the two waters were taken away and storm water was left behind, that councils would find themselves actually in a shortage of expertise that they didn't have at present. That is a potential risk, yeah. And then the other one is how often, how many, how many people do we have working inside the civic centre in our, in, roughly, in our, in our planning, engineering and uh, other components? Four, three waters. Yeah, four, three four, waters. Three waters, 103. 103. Um, how often do we have to go out to get external expertise and do we find that difficult when we do it in terms of our products that we deliver? The relevance here being, do we effectively, how much do we have, do we have already internally in-house, be, being a city of our size? Um, how much capacity do we have internally? So, so we're different to many of the other Otago South and Local Authorities in that we operate and maintain our own treatment plants. Um, so we have a, a, a capability and capacity um, advantage over the other councils that contract that service in. But my um, uh, experience is that we largely have the planning um, and delivery expertise to manage our contracts and plan the work 
and where we uh, require external support is some of the more specialised areas where we need geotech support or um, drawing up plans so we don't have, for example, a, a, a CAD resource so somebody can draw up all our plans uh, and that's where we um, get external support. Does that answer your question? I think so in as much as um, do we feel that we have a deficit of capacity or because I'm really getting back to when, when the as this bill is going forward, they're talking about entity size and efficiencies through size. And presumably once you get to a certain level, you are big enough to be an entity. And are we, as a city, as we stand at the moment with the staffing that we have, at least 90% of the way towards having the internal capacity to do what we do? I would understand very well that to our south, I would not expect them to have a massive water department but I would have thought that we actually could cover most of our activities internally and, and then we go outside for a limited amount of the material. Is that correct? Uh, it's, yeah, it's probably not as straightforward as that. So I've just done some rough sums and uh, we, in terms of our supply chain, more broadly, there's about 600 people involved. We employ 100 of those people. Um, so that includes contractors, consultants, all of the other people who do work to, to help run the three orders um, uh, or, or perform functions that uh, contribute to delivering the uh, three orders service. Um, but broadly, those functions are reasonably well resourced. Um, if you were to then talk about future change um, and additional regulation and other things, that would require an uplift in service. Uh, and and resource to, I guess, continue delivering the same service, but but by meeting the needs of regulators and any other um, additional requirements that come over time, which which have been signalled reasonably strongly. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a hard question to answer with any detail. And it presumably, then, the new entity would also have to up staff if, with, to meet those new increased regulations and outputs. Yeah, correct. Thank you. Um, Speaking as this very broad discussion about the entire Three Waters network and any hypothetical permutation of regional services, regional scale water services entities is, uh, I would, I'm keen to progress this sometime shortly. I've got Councillor Houlihan and Councillor Alder and then plenty more to go on the agenda for this meeting. Following on from Councillor O'Malley's question, I suppose the answer is going to be we don't know, but have we had any indication whether this entity will use the contractors that we have in place for these services? No, we, you don't, know. we don't know. We don't, we we don't, don't know, know anything about what the entity looks like. Uh, okay. it, hasn't been, it hasn't been presented to us for debate at this point. Is there a risk we could have unemployment all over the city as ripples out of this because of the fact that they won't use these contractors? or? You know, if they didn't use those contractors, could that be the result of that action? It seems highly unlikely, given that the work will still be required to be done, whoever, whoever's name is on the top of the paycheck for the people who do the work. Indeed, and we have some long-term contracts in place for some of that work to shore up a workforce yes. in the city. So how does that work if the contracts are with the DCC when that entity will then own those? Don't know. We don't know. Okay, thank Councilor you. Councillor Elder. Uh, just one more question, um, and that is, should we opt out? Um, the report is telling us that we probably need to double our investment in the three waters. Um, so what would that have implications for our budgets across the city? and our staffing capacity. Staffing capacity that's probably speculative at this point. It's difficult to speculate until we see the shape of the proposal and what opting out looked like if, if that were a decision of council. And so any analysis of whether we council wanted to or not would need to be a full and complete assessment of what that meant. I'm going to move the recommendations. Is there a seconder? Seconder Councillor Gary. Speakers. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, 
certainly this far on from when it was proposed, I am, you know, quite disheartened that we've still got so many questions without answers. And I think it's unfair on the people involved, the staff in our three waters particularly, um, and also all the councils around the city and around um, the country who don't know what's happening. So, um, yeah, I have serious concerns about this suggestion by the government. I know the government had good intentions. However, I think right now what it's left is just a whole lot of questions unanswered and many concerns from, I would assume, most of the councils will have similar questions to us. I don't think we still know how work is going to be prioritised. We don't know, well, we couldn't answer whether our contractors will have continued work. We don't know whether our own uh, Three Waters staff will have continued work. Um, one assumes they'll be picked up with the entity, but we don't know any of those things. Um, we don't know whether we're going to have metered water or not, so that could mean an increase in cost for our public here in Dunedin. We also, um, I believe, it certainly seems like it's going to add, if it goes ahead, another layer of red tape to builders. So anyone who wants to build or, or develop something will now have to deal with another entity. So they'd come to us for a lot of their other you know, issues that they've got in our departments that will have left. And then they would have to deal with the other entity on the three waters, or two waters in the case may be. We don't know whether we're going to be paid out for our assets, and we don't know whether they will pay our, give us any um, refund or money back for our, our debt. So there's a lot of questions that need answering, and I hope we get those answers soon. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Oh, you wish I'm not going to say a great deal because I think a lot of it's been covered, the debate's been covered in question time, in fact. Um, I note we are simply noting <clears throat> the update, and I thank the staff, um, Mr Drew, Mr Dyer, and their team for uh, the work that's gone on. And, and you wish, if I want to acknowledge your work with uh, mayors in, in uh, adjacent areas on, on these matters as well. Um, there is a great deal of uncertainty within uncertain times. And uh, what we need to do is listen carefully and hold our course uh, and remember what this came out of, the Havelock North um, drinking water debacle, and know that the, the purpose of it is a good one. How we get there and what it means for us, we don't know as yet. So we need to hold the line and uh, keep our ears wide open. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. Um, I think it's fair to say that this, this did come out of the Havelock North incident. And if you look at the Water Services Bill, it's generally centred around water um, intakes, and actually mostly around water intakes, with some mention of articulation systems, a little bit of mention of wastewater and just quite literally two lines where stormwater is mentioned in the bill. So in other words, this is a bill, the first bill is heavily centred around drinking water standards. And the establishment of a new regulatory service, a uh, new regulatory body or oversight, um, Tamata Arawai, I think it's clearly something that's been waited, needed for a long time and there's no doubt that that's all a good thing moving forward. The next component though is the one that I still think is relatively contentious. For me, it's contentious because of the ownership model that's being proposed at the moment, and, and that we've already taken one step, well, DIA has taken one step, a presumptive step already, and that is that the, that the ownership of the infrastructure will be taken out of the hands of territorial authorities. Presumably, I was taught once in HR, you can't tell what's in the other person's head, but presumably what DIA are thinking is that they can't leave that in the hands of the councils because they can't be trusted to deliver correctly because they failed to deliver in the past. But we have a new regulator, and that regulator is the enforcer of the standards. Presumably that regulator can enforce the standards. 
And the questions I asked earlier on about NZTA and the transport model is that we already have a, a situation where it is recognised by central government that territorial authorities cannot f afford to independently cover one section of their infrastructure, transport. So I agree that we recognise that central government will be needed to come to the table here. Why they're coming to the table also involves the removal of the assets from the territorial authorities. I don't understand, as ha and I do not believe it's been fully canvassed. So while we say, let's wait and see what's happening, the problem is that one of the steps has already been taken and we're not really making any commentary about it. And I think that councils need to make strong commentary about this change in ownership as we look at these authorities, because frankly, we can run it differently. A regional transport committee is a regional approach to transport, but all the territorial authorities own their assets. And NZTA, for, for all of its weaknesses, it's at least the mechanism by which central government money comes in and achieves the outcomes. And roads are built to a standard. We do things on our transport infrastructure which is built to a national standard. Why can't we have a situation where we do the same thing with water? The other thing I think we need to do individually is going forward we need to understand the total cost of the rate payer between if we opt out what will be the rates impact on us if the government then says opting out also means you don't get the money because there's a somewhat a veiled threat in the background there that opting in and opting out will, will result in different checks coming your way. And if we opt in and our water comes out of our rate bill and moves over to a water bill, what's the implication going to be to the total household costs anyway? because we keep talking about how we'll save money, but you as a ratepayer are not going to have any option. You're going to end up getting a water bill and a rate bill. And that it's a bit disturbing when we were talking about the structure of this and saying we're not going to be like a CCO, that when asked how you interface with this, the DIA said it will be a bit like interfacing with Aurora. Now, I don't want to turn this into Aurora bashing, but if we have a situation where we have taken the authority, which was once a department of council, moved it outside the council, and then, and then only through letters of intent and statements, letters of um, expectation and statement of intent we're controlling them, we lost control of their maintenance schedules. We'll have the same thing happening here, except this time it's going to be an entity that's bigger than our council. We've just had a situation where we're talking about transport and bus systems and public transport where two entities are operating in the same area. Mr Drew pointed out that stormwater is going to be a problem because if this happens and stormwater goes into it, there's going to be a change in authority just as water leaves the road and goes into a mud tank. So what are we going to face here again? Another authority operating inside our territorial authority where we don't even know quite how our interaction is going to be. I, I support 100% the drive the government is having towards good outcomes in drinking water and in treatment of foul water and how we're working with stormwater. But I really think that the government needs to take note, they need to slow down in the actual model of ownership. And what I'm asking, I'm asking the government, I'm asking them to please listen to voices like mine, and I hope that our council one day can get a unified voice on how we sit on this, to say, yes, we agree with going forward, but please slow down on these things because they're not necessarily the reason that you're stopping you moving forward. And we could have perverse outcomes if we make mistakes there, as we've seen in the past with electricity reform and transport reform. Thank you. All the motion, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you. Item 16, feedback on the draft 21-22 statements of intent. Mr Logie, welcome. No councillors, questions? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Worship. Um, I had 20 points so, that I originally feed back, so I'm very pleased to see a lot of those in here. I was just quite concerned around the, um, the sponsorship policy. Um, Aurora had moved this, changed their sponsorship from $20,000 a year to $10,000 a year, and I just saw that that was going to be addressed by the council um, working through a naming rights and sponsorship policy and I wondered is that an internal 
council policy or is it something that goes outside for consultation? It's uh, been on the work program for a while, but we've um, progressed it, uh, given it priority um, following the statements of intent, because there are a couple of other um, facilities where it's likely to crop up. But it needs, we need to look at it, because the um, companies are required to <coughs> align with our key policies and directions. We need to make sure that we, there's not some unintended consequences. So, for example, Forsyth Bar Stadium has a particularly unique um, naming rights agreement. And so that work is being done. Um, we haven't, literally, it will get onto the policy work program at, at a, as a priority after next week, once the um, tenure plan work is finished. And then we haven't, we haven't decided what process we'll use yet, where it will go, who will be consulted, how we'll, we'll build it. But it's complicated. So just to um, follow up, did we ask Aurora Energy to put $20,000 back in the budget for the sponsorship or is that going to sit back at 10000 or is the letter of expectation, sorry not the letter of expectation, the letter that we're sending back to them doesn't kind of cover that? Um, in discussions with, um, with Gemma Adams on behalf of the group. Um, we came to the conclusion that if we pr present them with a policy, which then they can then work through whether they adopt the same principles. In terms of the particular matter that you've raised around that particular item, um, the sponsorship in Aurora covers a lot of things, so they do a lot of in-kind work, um, which they don't necessarily report in that, so one of the things that we'll do as part of the policy is talk about actually the wider giving of, of money or in-kind support to the community so that we start getting the reporting aligned across all the entities rather than just focusing specifically on a, a dollar value sponsorship. Councillor okay. Walker. Um, <clears throat> yep, thank you, Your Worship. Um, yes, uh, thanks for the report and the feedback. Um, I was one of those people who did feedback into the SOIs um, and particularly around the use of single-use plastic at the stadium. And I noticed they came back and said DVML do not use single-use plastics. And they talk about it being uh, compostable. So my question is, I'd rather this went DVML, not you. Um, would you not agree that recycling in this case is not recycling, but actually just a theoretical possibility? So I don't know if that's a question for the CFO, <laughs> Councillor. <laughs> well, that's why I said I'd rather put yeah. that question to DVML. And, yeah, of course, I open by saying that. Certainly, um, DCHL um, have indicated that they're happy for DVML to come and talk to the Council around what they are trying to do. Um, obviously, they're trying to do the right thing, but they're coming up against the, 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 the struggles around finding an outlet for things that they put in place. I have no further questions. It's unfair to pick on. That's all, Lord. Around the uh, the ROS survey and the um, measure to be included that the uh, stadium achieve 85% ratepayer satisfaction. I just wonder if that's a figure that's never going to be achievable because some people inherently. <coughs> Uh, disagree with even having a stadium and owning a stadium and how we came to have one and I wonder if you would be better to aim for say a 95% satisfaction of users of the stadium or something like that because I think you'd much more get a truer response from the people like do you see that being problematic? The company, the company has indicated that they're happy with that measure. The questions? Move the recommendations. Move Councillor Lord. Seconded Councillor Hall. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? No. Okay. Speakers? Councillor Walker. No, I don't have to pick on the CFO. Um, yeah, I, I thank you for the report and thanks to the staff as well. And I broadly support the recommendations um, around the, the SOIs. Um, but as I mentioned, as a councillor that did bring uh, forward the questions around um, stronger action to reduce single-use plastics, I want to just briefly speak to our lack of action or perceived action around waste minimisation. And I guess it, 
what's the apparent snail's pace at which we seem to be able to move on this one, which is, in um, I guess, in, in terms of a world climate waste crisis is very, very, very low fruit. Um, and I say this is not an attack on the DCHL staff, and in particular <coughs> DVML, as their staff are diligent and hardworking. I say it in the context of item 23 of our supplementary agenda that we discussed earlier around initiating a strategic framework and refresh, embedding a model that will look to define and measure the sustainable outcomes for Dunedin. It is interesting to note last month, a Consumer NZ research finding that we, New Zealand, are the second worst country in the world for packaging recyclability. Here in Glee, green, clean Aotearoa, 57% of our packaging is non-recyclable in practice. That's not too bad when compared with Brazil, which is 97%, but fares terribly with our Aussie cousins across the water with just 14% of their packaging not being recyclable. Um, in that particular assessment last month, I'm referring to, it is important to note that a recyclable uh, product is, as I mentioned earlier in my question, recyclable in practice. This means there is an existing collection, sorting and recycling system in place that recycles the packaging. In other words, consumers can actually recycle these products in their home country or in their home cities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, again, it's not just a theoretical possibility. That possibility is used by many companies to, to get out of jail when it comes to their responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the environment. The, theor the theoretical possibility that something might actually be recycled is not good enough for an organization like DVML and their insistence that they do not use single-use uh, plastics will not fool this councillor. Let's do better, let's be leaders, let's be leaders in this sphere, and let's carry out the obligations we have set ourselves in our waste minimization and management plan and the promises we've embedded for ourselves in our 2030 zero carbon goals. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm very happy to support approving this, this feedback. I had 20 pieces of feedback that I gave, um, including some that were around the overall, um, including the DCC strategic framework. We own $1.4 billion of assets, as well as um, financial return that we're not necessarily seeing at the moment. They also need to align with um, other things like our carbon neutrality goal, our sponsorship policy, um, and our recycling as well, our waste management. So I was very pleased to see um, some good analysis here. Um, the reason I asked earlier about the DCHL's letter of expectation and um, changing the date is that our processes don't, don't really seem to align and that the cart has moved far beyond the horse. Um, DCHL send their letters of expectation, um, it's in the SOIs, around about, I guess, October, November, and they've done them by the 31st of December, and we sent our letter of expectation in February, so there is definitely a cart for the horse, and we have to use our assets with the CCOs more strategically, so I really do want to see those processes um, more aligned. So I'm very happy to see the feedback, I'm happy to see the, um, the letter back to DCHL and I will look forward to seeing updated SOIs that reflect our, our strategic um, thoughts, I guess, and some of the uh, little items that we brought up as well. Councillor Hulahan. Thank you. Following on from Councillor Walker's comments, um, I have to agree with quite a few of the things he said because um, there are a lot of products that, so com some companies are making a lot of money out of um, really no benefit to the environment at all, but they're saying they're environmentally friendly, that they're compostable, when in actual fact the issue is we can't compost a lot of our, you know, if you've got a cup or a plate or whatever you've bought that says it's compostable, you can't actually compost it here in Dunedin. There's no resource that will properly do that to a degree where it's, um, you know, biodegradable and reduced out of the environment. I, um, as you all know, I've gone on about this quite a bit, but my children are at an Enviro school and I was part of an audit for a waste 
Um, and as part of that, I had to order in, because we asked everyone just to bring a plate for the fear, and um, with that, it reduced the waste that we had, but we had to have some, um, you know, things that they could take away. So I ordered in compost. I went to a lot of trouble and had to order in all these plates and cups from Auckland, and they were all compostable. They cost a fortune. I could only get them in Auckland. There was nowhere else that actually sold them, and I was so pleased with myself. And then I got told, oh, no, these ones actually can't even be composted here in Dunedin. So I think it's something, as a city council, if we are serious and ambitious about our goals for the environment, that we need to look at having some sort of system Doug seems to know a lot about that. He might be able to help, but some sort of system where we can um, get compost these products because they're everywhere and you can't get rid of them. Thank you. Councillor Lord, your right of reply. I know more. He surrenders. <laughs> All those in favour? I think we do a standstill. Uh, Th those against? No. Record it, please. That's agreed. Uh, item 17, in terms of reference for the review of the Dunedin City Council of Waikawaiti, Karatane and Hawkesbury Village water response, Ms Graham. Thank you, Your Worship. There's just one um, addition I would like to make, councillors, to the terms of reference, which was an oversight on my part. Um, on page 258 of your papers, the first bullet point should obviously have read um, to the relevant DCC staff elected members organisations and or authorities. So if you could add that the word elected members in, the words. Um. <coughs> That's helpful. To move Councillor and there may, there may well be questions. Who, Councillor Lord? It's probably just a question for Sandy, but um, in doing this and us appointing an independent reviewer, and I know what they say about independent reviewers, but can we be confident that this won't be just seen as a sort of council whitewash. Would it be um, like not that there's anything too whitewash? I don't mean it like that. But what I mean, will this will this appease the people that are perhaps unhappy with the situation? Will this be something that can, we can definitely say is absolutely legitimately above board? I can say it will be legitimately independent. Whether it appeases anybody, that I can't comment on. Councillor, oh, yeah, Councillor Lord, Your Worship, I'm oh, just following up on, on Councillor Lord's question um, about the independent reviewer. I, I noted that the um, impact statement, you know, the summary considerations, uh, that given that mana whenua were affected at uh, Pukachiraki or Karitani, um, do we have? Is there like an uh, um, an adjunct process where where reviewers are appointed that there is a like a corresponding mana whenua perspective given by a, a reviewer? That's a good question that I haven't fully considered. Um, I have been canvassing my um, chief executive and local government colleagues about uh, names from people outside of the city who might um, be appropriate to bring a level of independence to this process. And so, depending on what terms of reference we adopt, I'll then sort of use that as a framework for bringing back options for you to choose a reviewer. Councillor Reddick. Second bullet point uh, in the terms of reference, appropriateness of actions. And the, uh, the five, bullet point number five is appropriateness and timeliness. Could we put appropriateness and timeliness in the second bullet point, please. Was there any reason why it was left out? But I suppose it's the first qu is the question, and could we insert it? The answer to the second question is entirely up to you, Councillor. The, the answer to the first question is probably for the author of the report. So if there's no particular reason for leaving it out, I'd like go to... Ahead, go ahead, go ahead. There was no particular reason for leaving it out, and it causes me no problem with Council of a Mind to add it in. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor O'Malley? Well, be... I'd like to propose that amendment. Is that what... I think that the tidiest way to do it would be to 
to deal with it's been Councillor Venev has indicated a willingness to move. I can't imagine he's allergic to including it in the substantive motion. So we can deal with that. Councillor O'Malley. I think um, my question relates to the um, expertise of the reviewer that we're going to uh, appoint. Um, it sort of gets to the terms of reference. As I go through them, it looks like the terms of references are mostly around our timing and our communications and our decision to move. Is there going to be any um, attempt to try to describe what we think might have happened or just the actual way we responded to the lead levels? That work is already underway as part of the discussions with Public Health South about um, the next steps in the res restoration of re reticulated water. So that's covered by another body of work and that's why it's not in this body of work. So this one is, is almost entirely around um, almost our internal processes and our processes for reporting and acting. Indeed, and that's why we're waiting to um, start this work when all those other processes have been completed because the reviewer will have those as background information and then look at what needs to be done that hasn't already been covered. Okay, so then that, that does change the expertise requirements of the reviewer quite dramatically. Okay, thank you. Moved by Councillor Vandiver, seconded Councillor O'Malley. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Speakers? I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 18, adoption of the litter Aye. compliance policy 2020. Mr Drew and Mr Henderson, welcome. Anything by way of introdu introduction, gentlemen? No. <coughs> Questions? Councillors? Councillor Elder. I, I note Spokes put in a, um, a submission to this, and, um, you know, we are acting in, in, in improving um, our response from the DCC angle. Was there any, is there any um, way that we can also um, talk to the university about the glass on <coughs> the one-way system um, related to the ability to use the cycleway through that area? Uh, we do have regular contact with the proctor's office and with the property department at the university and Campus Watch especially in regards to all waste issues in the university area. Um, I'm not too sure what you mean in regards to the one-way system, if you're talking about cleaning the one-way system? Yes. Yeah, I don't, know, um, I don't think our transport department do that. I believe it's NZTA. I'm not entirely sure of that. Um, so, so there's no um, formal accountability structure in, within the university's response to the amount of glass that is in the one-way system in the cycle path. No, nor, nor would you anticipate the university would take responsibility for anything that was found on the road network? Except that they provide accommodation along that network? Oh, among others, yes. Yeah. There, there are plenty of mechanisms that allow us to have these conversations with the university, but it does sit outside what is being proposed at this meeting. Councillor Gary. Just want to indicate a willingness to move. Gratefully received, thank you. Further questions, Councillor Wiley? There we go, that would be better. Um, question, Mr Henderson. When I read through this, and I, you know, obviously the focus of trying to improve the litter compliance of the, um, especially around the university area and the campus area, is um, the skip day still operating? Uh, obviously the next <laughs> This thing's got a mind of its own, right. 
Um, the skip days aren't operated by the DCC, they're operated by the university. My understanding is that they are discontinuing skip days. What they've done is, if you go to the Waste, Man uh, Waste Management Limited now have the contract for the university, camp uh, university area, a student that goes to the Wycliffe Street transfer station owned by Waste Management can produce their student ID and dispose of waste at no charge. Okay. The, but the skip days, were they not run by OUSA? Yes, and their focus has shifted away from waste and towards diversion, so they, they're now running um, diversion days uh, instead of that to encourage the reuse of those resources as opposed to biffing them in a hole in the ground. Thank you. Um, when we look at a lot of the residents in through uh, student area, are they creating dramatically more waste than a normal household? Uh, it'd be certainly fair to say that they have a higher density occupancy. So yes, they are, are creating more waste than the average household, yes. And then, to a certain point, would it not be feasible to even if we looked at um, a, a weekly rubbish service in that area, and even if it was a targeted rate on that basis, to improve that ability? As a weekly rubbish collection service, uh, not, with, not with glass or recycling. Or recycling. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, under it is envisaged under the upcoming new contracts that we would uh, be able to look at the services that are provided in university area. Under our current contracts, our, our contractor doesn't have the resources to provide additional uh, collections on an ongoing basis. They can basically they don't have sufficient vehicles to add in another weekly connection uh, every week of the year in that area. And glass is the predominant um, rubbish that especially with regards to this uh, litter, compl uh, litter compliance that we're looking at? Uh, I would actually suggest that glass is the most visible uh, but there are, it is uh, probably wider than just glass but glass would be the most visible contaminant. Yep. Okay, thank you. Councillor Reddick. Summary of email feedback. Were there any no's reply received? It's all yes. It's fine. And 2.2.2, uh, 2 .2, rubbish bags put out for collection before 3 p.m. or after 6 p.m. in the CBD. The, uh, I have noticed with rubbish bags that were there before 3 p.m., they get uh, attacked by seagulls and so forth. So, uh, so that's a very good... Um, initiative to have in there, but will there be a public education campaign about that? Uh, so to be fair, we've always had that rule about putting when you should put out bags in the CBD area. Uh, it's one of the jobs of our um, city custodian is when we identify people that are uh, putting out bags before or after the collection, which means they stay there all night and, and through to the next day, uh, is trying to individually contact those uh, businesses or inner city residents that we uh, to educate them, yes. But that's in retrospect, you know, that's after they've, and it's quite difficult to identify the bags. So my question is, is there any plan for a proactive public education plan, program or initiative or anything? Yeah, to be, uh, that's an ongoing thing because obviously residents and even the tenancies for businesses change quite regularly. So we have a basically an ongoing rolling program where we uh, contact people um, as uh, on an ongoing basis in that area. Not only after they've offended, if you can identify them. I uh, know we are, uh, so basically it is some proactive communications. But so if we if we know that people have changed or tenancies have changed, we'll actually go in and, and talk to the business proactively. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Worship. Um, Mr Henderson, uh, is it, Mr Drew, um, is it true to say that while there's a lot of focus in the submissions and, and the questions around the student area, this policy is much, much wider, this is city-wide, is that, is that correct? Okay, so with that in mind, can you speak to how useful this will be as a tool to deal with fly tipping, which has been a, an issue in some of the semi-rural areas of our city? Uh, with re 
With respect to fly tipping, nothing has particularly changed between this and the previous iteration of the, of the policy. Um, the ongoing issue is identifying those responsible for fly tipping, um, and that, that is the issue we have with that. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for the report. Um, my question relates specifically to the submission from Spokes, and there's a couple of questions around that. I think they quite rightly highlight the, the issue of glass and cycleways, which all of us who do cycle have, have, have learned at, at, at great expense, I'm afraid. So my question is, first question is in the context of European cities who have universities and cycleways, their approach is to clean rather than educate. Um, is there any moves by us or another authority to create a machine that actually fits the cycleways to clean them every day early in the morning? Because it does perplex me that doesn't exist. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about if NCTA are progressing that, because I think you're talking about the State Highway 1 cycleways, which is um, maintained by NZTA. Um, and uh, Dunedin City Council doesn't have a need at the moment. Uh, and generally, if a uh, if, if customer services are called, then a team will be dispatched to clean up uh, reported broken glass. So is that a conversation we can p perhaps think about having with NZTA? Yeah, I'm happy to take that discussion up. And I guess around my first point, I, was, I may not create into question now, has there been any analysis done of what other cities do in terms of what I mentioned around, rather than focusing our resources on education, and actually cleaning, the example I'm thinking of is Freiburg in Germany. They gave up on education, they just clean well. Early in the morning before anyone's up. No, we haven't, uh, yeah, we haven't done any research on that at our end, no. Councillor O'Malley. Bishop, um, how many little litter control officers do we have? Uh, in theory, we have uh, 8.75. Everyone in my department is licensed as a litter control officer. How many do we have patrolling the streets? Uh, about 0.3. I guess I'm getting to the ability to issue a broken glass notice to a breaker of glass. Um, when do you think the breaker of glass will be operating? My sense would be quite late at night, quite often. And do we have litter control officers operating during that period? Uh, no, the answer to the question, no. Outside of normal business hours, we don't have anyone out there, no. Thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Worship. Um, a couple of questions. The first of them is following on from the question you just had. Um, are you confident that the university's review of its discipline procedures, which is currently underway, will complement the capacity, the new capacities around such matters uh, into the future? Uh, yeah, we were very pleased to see that they had actually included a specific mention of, of glass in there and, and, and uh, actually trying to take some responsibility for tidiness around the student flatting area, which uh, had been an area um, we talked to them often about and hadn't been a focus for them in the past, so um, yes, it would complement this very well. Thank you. And the second question is about paragraph two, th section 2.3 uh, and the r capacity that a litter control officer will have to do several things, um, which is welcome. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the third one though, the screening, the direction to screen or obscure from view. I'm assuming that is, can I make the assumption that that is the action that will be followed in the way that we've screened the cardboard collection areas or a cafe might screen bins rather than a solution for our favourite friends in View Street? Can, can I be sure that there'd be no instruction to cover up the rat-infested pile of garbage bags rather than remove them. Uh, unfortunately, that is the wording straight from the Litter Act. 
um, is to we can actually know just to cover or screen. So that's that's the wording we need to use. Okay. It comes from the literature. But the the first option, the other two options would be the preferable ones. Obviously, thank you, Councillor O'Malley. So I sort of going back to that question, I was just thought thinking. Only a litter control officer warranted under Section 5 of the Litter Act is authorised to, to put an infringement notice. Can we authorise a litter control officer who is not a DCC employee, such as a Campus Watch employee? Uh, no, and the, the a litter control officer needs to uh, have, a, be, have an employment relationship or be a contractor of council. However, we can uh, authorise camp, the likes of Campus Watch as litter wardens. Uh, that can do most things so they can't issue the infringements, but they can provide the information to the DCC and we can then issue infringements. So is it the case then that it looks like we're putting through a bylaw and having no enforcement capacity to enforce it outside working hours when it comes to broken glass? Not a bylaw an activity of council that has an infringement associated with it. Uh, yeah, there is a, a limit. I mean, um, one of the things that we are looking at is other, other areas of council for argument, just for example, environmental health uh, could also be licensed uh, under this so that they can actually take action as well. Um, so we can expand the areas of council that can take some responsibility for this. Councillor Reddick. Um, my reading of 1.2.4 is if a letter control officer is investigated and has a reasonable cause to believe an individual is responsible for the offence, then he can in issue an infringement. So would that mean in practice that a campus watch officer could inform the letter control people and perhaps possibly even supply evidence? Uh, yeah, a litter, a litter warden can collect evidence pro and provide it to a litter control officer for infringement purposes, yes. So that would effectively, you know, uh, give you more tentacles, I suppose, more outreach of the program? Yeah, I would just need to, from the Campus Watch perspective, I would just need to say that they prefer an educational approach uh, as, a being, as, as opposed to a heavy-handed approach for the students. Moved by Councillor Gary. Is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Elder. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? I would, Your Worship. Uh, this litter compliance policy addresses uh, a number of submissions through the consultation, which uh, were all in one direction, and it was around broken glass and uh, litter being accumulated. And we also had submissions through the 10 year plan that spoke about this as well. Um, but rather than being focused entirely on the student area, it, it addresses it throughout the city. Um, and, and it's not just about students, it's around landlords too, allowing uh, rubbish to accumulate. Uh, and I take the point of some of my colleagues who, who mentioned the, the idea of cleaning up as a way to deal with this as a strategy. Uh, we do this with graffiti, where we don't let the graffiti sit there for very long, but clean it up. But I particularly want to focus on the fact that it gives us further tools to address the issues that were outlined um, in the report of litter and smashed glass. Uh, and I particularly want to reference the Sophia Charter, uh, where there's been a lot of work done um, by our staff, and to uh, mention Elspeth and Bede Cristani, who will uh, no doubt uh, watch this either through live stream or later on. Um, who, whose work and intent in terms of the Sophia Charter, uh, one very strong component of the Sophia Charter was around litter control, and particularly litter control in the student area. Um, and so this policy today that we, I hope that we will approve um, <coughs> speaks to that and uh, confirms that we are serious about this and that we want to strengthen our ability to address the issue, particularly of smash glass, but also litter accumulation uh, in our city and in the student area, um, and to make sure it's a, a city that we're proud of in terms of cleanliness uh, and uh, the way that we present it 
to the outside world. Um, so I'm happy to support this. Sorry, Melly. Um, as a person who uses the cycleway on State Highway 1, probably less frequently, frequently than I should, um, I would have to say, actually, I don't find that much glass in it, because people keep saying about how covered in glass it is. I think I've encountered one broken bottle in about, well, I don't, so the council walkers had four punches. I've encountered one broken bottle in about the last 50 times I've ridden it. Um, it is, now, if you go over to Leith and Clyde, and you go there on Saturday morning, it looks like a bottle recycling plant all over the road. Um, the, and, I, and the cycle is clean once a week. Um, I am looking at this though, and it's reminded me of the Beaches and Reserve Bylaw where we had a series of things that we could issue something on, and then we put in no policing of it in the bylaw. And from the questions I've, had of, I've, I've given to staff now, the people who are breaking the glass are doing it at 1 a.m. and they've been drinking. And if we don't have anybody out there at the time, how are we going to identify that person with the broken glass? So we're going to have a situation where we perceive a need and, and, and we have put in place a potential, an ability to, to issue a fine and then we've not put in place the ability to actually identify the person doing it. So I think this is, in many respects, saying we'd like to do something and then not actually following through with it with an actual process of achieving it. Um, and the last thing I do want to comment on is um, the students in OUSA will probably come back and say to this and much of what they said to the um, stuff that's coming through the University Council right now, uh, are you just doing a little bit of student bashing here and have you provided all the facilities required for them to be able to meet their ability to comply? And I think I hear Mr. Henderson saying that in the new waste plans that are waste futures, we are probably going to help with compliance, and I think that's a necessary component if we're going to have this side to the, of, of, our, of how we address it as well. But I don't think we should go away with just education, because the old fine handed out is quite educating in and of itself. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, I noticed one of the councillors was quick to blame landlords in this, but I can honestly say that most landlords are not up at 1am in the morning throwing broken bottles drunk on the road. Um, so, you know, I think it is, I can honestly say that there is a major issue with rubbish, particularly around the north end, um, and it's often, it's at end of year when they're all changing over and flats are are changing and there's you know what happens is a lot of students leave earlier so maybe you know mid-november or something and you have a gap where there's rubbish but it doesn't get collected now there used to be a really good system where they put out skips they could all throw the things in and it was used really well and that's now gone and I think that's a shame. There used to be also a system for um, recycling as well. I don't think that's offered either, but there is a recycle centre down the north end. Um, but obviously, once again, if things are made easy, people will do them. If they have to, if it takes a bit of effort, um, a lot of people don't tend to bother to do it. But um, what I would say, I liked the comments around the attitude of Campus Watch is to try to work with people um, in education and looking at ways to resolve situations without being heavy handed. And anywhere where we have to look at putting um, you know, large fines or, or coming down heavy on people for the litter, I think, I don't want to see council taking that stance personally. Um, I would like to see us try to make it easier for them to get rid of their rubbish because at the end of the day you can find them but we're still not going to solve the problem and we need to solve the problem so to have a skip out would be great because we've got to get rid of the rubbish. Ideally we you know, educate them to recycle, reuse and don't collect so much stuff but of course a lot of students will buy, well, so do we, let's face it, takeaways where you've got takeaway boxes and stuff and you've got, you know, lots of things that need to be thrown out. It's, as Councillor Walker, I think, said earlier, or someone said, that our country is one of the highest of wrapping paper that you can't get, can't get rid of. And I think that's a bigger issue that we need to look at addressing. Maybe we write a letter to 
the minister about that, whatever minister it is, but you know, suggesting maybe it's the environment minister saying, can we look at, at proactive ways to reduce the amount of wrapping used in supermarkets because it is causing a big problem with our increased rubbish. Councillor Barker. Um, I support this policy and I totally agree with um, Councillor O'Malley about the toothlessness of it, given that we've got 0.3 of a person policing this during business hours when most of the um, broken glass, etc., happens during drinking hours. I just, um, when we're talking, we're talking about litter here, and I'm actually thinking, looking at seven of the submissions mentioned broken glass, and broken glass doesn't appear to me to be litter, it appears to be vandalism. So I would support us looking at putting some money in their 10 year plan to actually police this problem. In Dunedin, it seems that the streets glitter like gold, and it would be very disappointing to all of those people who wander through to find um, that it's just broken glass. We've been back in 2009, the city leaders. Um, this is the councillors and city leaders signed a litter pledge, a city le leader pledge to pick up litter, including Councillor Staines, who was on council then and isn't here now. And I would certainly like to see um, some more leadership from um, our councillors here. And I think when we're talking about broken glass, it's not just down in the, in the um, student area. We also see it when any of us councillors walk through the streets on a Monday morning. So it's not just a student problem, it is a city problem. Councillor Gary, your right of reply. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I want to be very clear this is not about student bashing. And in fact, to remind councillors that uh, in the formation of the Sophia, Christa, uh, Christina Sophia Charter, OUSA, uh, Campus Watch, the university, the police, etc., etc., our staff were involved uh, in putting that charter together, and, and, and it included, obviously, the Christanis at the heart of that. Um, and so education uh, was very much part of that as well. In fact, um, I, I was curious to hear uh, a councillor just speak about us educating students. I would suggest to you that the majority of students could educate us in regards to uh, waste minimisation. Um, it is just a minority for whom this is an issue. Um, and certainly uh, my comments were not blaming landlords, but there is an issue at the end of the year um, when there's that changeover of tenants and these leftover items, and I commend um, the students and in particular OUSA for their work in diversion recently, the diversion scheme, I believe they had a, a whole building or gym full of um, uh, furniture and so forth uh, to deal with that particular issue. Um, so they could show us a thing or two in that regard. Uh, but I believe this policy will help. It's not going to be the, the total panacea, um, but it will certainly give some tools towards dealing with this issue. And I commend and thank the staff for bringing this to us. Thank you. I'll put it all those in favour. Aye. Those against, that's agreed. I'll move that we adjourn the meeting until a quarter past three. Seconded Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Those against, that's agreed. Thank you.
16, ladies and gentlemen. Item 19, Regulatory Subcommittee Recommendation on Dangerous and Insanitary Buildings Policy Review. Mr. Drew, no, Mr. Pickford and Mr. Henderson, my apologies, are here to ask, answer questions of the policy. Councillor while you'll speak to the recommendations. Are there any questions of the policy? Councillor Barker. On page 282, there's mention of the Central City Heritage Reuse Grant Scheme, and I asked the Heritage Advisor if that scheme was still going, and it isn't still going because all of the money has been put into the <laughs> Dunedin Heritage Funds. So I wonder if that could be changed. That's not really a question. The trouble, is, the trouble is at this point the scope for making a, amendments without sending it back to the subcommittee appears limited. However, it is, in, in, it is incorrect. It doesn't include the Dunedin, the Central City Heritage Reuse Grant Scheme does not, does not exist anymore. Suggestions for moving forward? I mean, certainly the intention of, amount of aggregating the various funds that existed was for them to be sitting within a similar, within one collective group. Not certainly the intention wasn't that those individual, whether it's rates relief or this one, ceased to exist, even if they don't even if it's not called by that name. The concern is, like I did, was I googled and I looked up through the council things as I might, I might excitedly be a heritage own, building owner and look up this fund only to find that it doesn't exist or there's a 404 on the um, website. My concern is that we're um, promulgating an in, in incorrect... The, 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 the question's been raised. Um, I don't... Are there other, other questions of the policy, aside from that? Councillor Benson Boat. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm eternally hopeful, gentlemen, that the provisions of this bylaw and also other changes in the Building Act might give us the capacity to take action against those buildings which, while they're not insanitary because there's no one in them, are nonetheless presenting a hazard to the public because their leaking and dripping rotten verandas are held up by scaffolding props, as is the case on Princess Street and Amant Street. Am I, um, are my hopes fulfilled? Uh, not at this stage, Councillor. All right. Not at this stage. There, there is no provision for, I know what you're after in terms of the insanitary provisions and, and dangerous building. But a number of the clauses here talk about risk to the public um, and where verandas are held up by temporary measures, surely there is the capacity to take some sort of action to require the owners to make good given they're obstructing public space as well? Uh, not within the Building Act, I'm afraid. In terms of the bylaw? We can't require anything no. greater than the Building Act. Well, there's some pretty, um, there are some new elements and extensions in the bylaw of what was previously the case, that we, we had no capacity, but surely, well, could I ask if staff have a look at, in terms of the bylaw, at the issues I'm raising about two areas of the city where there are dangerous verandas, or they wouldn't have to be held up by scaffolding, which in itself obstructs the public footpath. There must surely be some capacity to take action against those owners. <coughs> So if, if a veranda is dangerous, and in the case that you're mentioning, they've applied a scaffolding to make it safe, that's as far as our powers go. 
under this policy. Hopes again are dashed. Thank you. I've just been thinking about Councillor Barker's question and certainly the advice that we've had around making amendments to the recommendations at this point in the process has largely been predicated on the fact that we'll be making suggestions that have been through a public process without people being able to comment uh, on those. Um, but I find it hard to believe that this would be substan so, so, so substantive a change to trigger those sorts of concerns. But so I'm just in the middle of um, getting some very quick advice, but my, my sense and my advice to the meeting, if I don't get it, is a change that is um, correcting an error of fact, um, like that would be able to be made at this point. But I'm just trying to get confirmation of that. Otherwise, I'll take it on my own cognizance and say that it's fine. The questions of the policy. Councillor Elder and then Councillor Lord. So just uh, thank you, Chair, and following up from what uh, Mr Benson Pope said, um, is it clear that, that in the process of um, the a building being perceived and actually unsafe, the process is then that you send a notice and then they have to act on it and then um, if it's continually unsafe you can, um, can prosecute but if they amend it you can't. So if, if we deem a building as dangerous um, you can mitigate that danger through for example the provision of a hoarding that stops people entering into that. Uh, but the building remains dangerous until the point where it's fixed. Um, it's only when you have the affected building that potentially we would be quicker at um, making them because it impacts on somebody else. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lord. It's probably not quite of the policy, but I just wanted to follow up on Councillor Benson Pope's point, and that is what, I mean, like, the building across the way here, this building, they've got all scaffolding all around them, but we know it's for a finite time till the job is done. Is there absolutely nothing that permits... Can anyone put up a scaffolding around their building and leave it there as long as they want and we have no... Because it it's really is about the public space. I mean, they become dangerous in themselves for cyclists and for pedestrians and just... Is there nothing we can do about that? Um, not, not under the Building Act, certainly. Do you require a licence to occupy if you're a cafe with seats and tables, but not if you're putting up scaffolding surrounding a building? Hmm. Councillor O'Malley? Um, does this extend, in terms of um, dangerous, does this extend to an owner of a building that takes a roof off and then by leaving the roof off, the building could be exposed to the elements and in itself pose a risk of falling down. Yes. <laughs> One we own. Um, I guess if you Simple make answer. alterations to a building that ultimately could make it dangerous, um, but again, we'd obviously want an engineering report possibly to assess that. <clears throat> no further questions. Have we resolved our um, drafting issue? Well, we've resolved it in that I can't get hold of legal, but um, using I've, I've reviewed it, I've checked with the members of the subcommittee, and given it's an error of fact, I think the I'm asking the GSO just to add in that um, the policy will have section 2.1 amended to stop at the um, Dunedin Heritage Fund full stop. Um, thank you. Yeah, happy to move the um, recommendations. Is there a seconder? Seconded, Councillor Raddick. Um, to be honest, um, as we went through this process, um, 
One, we were again disappointed that there wasn't a lot more engagement from the public around it, um, and really having only one submission. Um, and when we go through, uh, I appreciate the staff time and energy, along with my fellow uh, panel members, Councillor Houlihan and Councillor Vandervis. Um, a lot of what's been um, asked in questions, um, I can assure that we asked the same questions. Um, <coughs> We were very con consequent of Councillor ben um, Benson Pope and what he would be asking. Um, <laughs> Didn't do anything about it. Though. Yeah, and, and that and that and that's actually it was again we had a very good discussion around that as well, and it's it's, it's frustrating, but it is the framework that we were given, and what we worked with. And so um, thank you for all those involved. Other yeah, speakers, Romelli. Doesn't so much relate to this bylaw, but it relates to Councillor Benson Pope's. Um, issue, I believe the roading bylaw may actually have a solution in it because the road is now defined as boundary to boundary, it includes the footpath and we are not, you're not allowed to obstruct or put any obstruction in the roadway. It's probably worth looking at. In, we'll include cafe tables and chairs. Uh, further speakers? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against, that's agreed. Item 20, a submission to the Gambling Commission on review of charitable trust licence conditions for casinos. Councillor Walker is sitting back. Mr Pickford and Mr Meacham. <coughs> Questions, councillors? Councillor Gary? I just want to foreshadow that I intend to move with an amendment, Your Worship. Oh, thank you. Can it be put up if it's yes, so present? Yes, the we'll GSO has it, Lynn thank has you. it, yes. Councillor Barker. Question around um, paragraph 25 on page 293. Um, as part of the Gambling and TAB venue policy review, the Council resolved to lobby central government through LGNZ for a more sustainable model of funding for community organisations to replace the reliance on gambling proceeds. I wonder where Council is at with that. So the letter has been sent um, as requested to the Ministry. And I would hate to get anybody's expectations up around the, any work local government New Zealand may do around this in the in the short term. The 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 pri it certainly doesn't fit within the priority areas of work, which are largely around the government's reform agenda, which is somewhat all-consuming. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, are we, uh, Mr. Pickford, are we aware of um, how many um, not-for-profits benefited from the? Um the casino, Dunedin City Kits, City Casino, um, and the community fund. No. Councillor Gary, we're all yours, and I'm happy to second the motion. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I was moved to. Um, to add this uh, note in, and I would suggest it would be a new number four uh, in the submission. Um, and I was moved to add it from my experience of the chairing the um, the class four <coughs> gaming machines bylaw. But in particular, I was very surprised when I read this report that the casinos are all have different licences, all with different conditions, um, and to read that they use uh, them to a certain extent as competitive advantages according to what the conditions are. Um, and, it's, and I support the submission that um, has been, dra have been drafted, has been drafted uh, with the idea of a more consistent approach throughout 
uh, to all of the casinos. This, this submission is not about the Dunedin casino, this is about all casinos, um, <coughs> and to try and get a bit more of a consistent approach. Uh, and I did note that when it came to the level of, uh, both the level of community funding, it varied considerably. Um, and we don't necessarily know what each of them contribute as a um, percentage. Um, and in some cases, in terms of their distribution, it varied widely. Um, some were quite specific, some were specific to particular charities, uh, which, which is great, but, but it wasn't consistent across, and it would seem to me that it would be helpful if that was consistent, and also I felt being tied to the well-beings would be a useful, um, a useful way to align it. So that would be the reasoning behind uh, the amendment that I've suggested. But apart from that, I think the direction and, and particularly noting um, several of the decisions we've already made in, in terms of the class four uh, machines and the um, intention in the letter to local government New Zealand um, is useful to note in this submission. The speakers. What's the Where is the... <coughs> See it to speak to. <coughs> Further speakers? Councillor Elder? Um, just speaking to um, our letter to central government, I think it's really important to recognise that um, a lot of funding to a lot of places, um, ch um, community, community um, organisations and sports organisations do come from the, um, the um, gambling kind of trust, charitable trusts, and I believe that if 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 things are going to change, then we do need to recognise that the gov central government needs to pick up some of the tab for enabling um, these groups to have um, sustainable funding. Um, otherwise, I think you know people will find it really difficult. Those organisations could find it difficult. And I'd go slightly broader than that, and I don't know if uh, laying the responsibility at the feet of central government is um, necessarily going to be the solution. It's certainly true that public funders uh, will need to cover the shortfall somehow, but public funders exist at uh, national and local levels, whether it's government or community trusts or the like, uh, if we are to try and um, ease people off uh, the uh, the addiction to the proceeds of gambling that prop up so many of our um, worthy uh, community organisations. I, I support the submission and, and thank um, and thank staff for responding to the invitation to make a submission on this. I was surprised at how few of the local authorities <coughs> who were specifically targeted for giving feedback on this didn't choose to take up that. Uh, that opportunity, um, but it seems helpful for us to be able to give feedback that is consistent with our own policies and approaches to um, uh, mitigating the, the harmful impacts of, uh, of gambling in our community. And I think I mean, it's, a, it's a creature of history the way that the licence conditions have evolved in various parts of the country, but there's certainly merit, I think, in, uh, in there being consistency around how those are applied. Um, but also consistency between uh, how we treat or the expectations we have of uh, the proceeds of gambling from casinos and the expectations that we have around the proceeds of gambling from pokey machines and there doesn't seem to be a, a particularly strong alignment there. I um, mean the, the social licence it would seem is, and this is uh, how we got to this point, the, the social licence for, uh, for gambling or those who profit from gambling is predicated on uh, charitable giving, uh, essentially, and I uh, again wholeheartedly support the uh, the um, the response in our submission that the the trusts that dispense of that funding be independent of the collectors of the money, the 
blackjack table or the slot machines uh, or wherever. Um, you know, we're, similar to the discussion we had when we had reviewed our own uh, policies, the, the areas of greatest need in our community, and I welcome the amendment that speaks to um, you know, the, the, the breadth of well-being challenges that we have, um, you know, the, the greatest need in our community, whether it's social, environmental or cultural, isn't necessarily going to be um, best determined by uh, a, the operator of a casino, and, and it's certainly something that needs to be given some thought as to how the, how the, the breadth of uh, that need can be better addressed through the structure of the trust, certainly from a greater degree of arm's length than, than currently exists, and uh, I look forward to seeing the outcome uh, of this in due course. Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and I concur with uh, all of the sentiments expressed, uh, and, and it comes down to independent trust, consistent application and alignment throughout in terms of the way the funding is dispersed. And I believe this submission speaks to all of those things. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Uh, that's agreed. Uh, item 21, the Dunedin City Council's submission on Building Code Update 2021 uh, proposals. Mr West and Mr Bainbridge Zafar are coming to speak to it. Um, I have already submitted on this uh, as chair of a separate entity uh, and as such um, will withdraw from this and leave uh, the deputy mayor to chair this agenda item. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, staff, would you like to speak to this at all, the report? No? So we'll move on to questions. Does anyone have any questions of staff? Uh, Councillor Vandervis. Why is it that you're recommending essentially demonising LPG and natural gas alongside coal? I can understand coal, and Huntley obviously is a, a blight on the uh, natural environment, but the answer or the immediate practical solution to Huntley's coal consumption is gas. Why would we not use a far more environmentally friendly energy source, plentifully locally available? Uh, why does this particular submission lump it in with coal? Sorry. Councillor, I think that's in line with our carbon zero aspirations and the work that we're doing around reducing LPG usage across our facilities. So it, f it seems sensible to align it with that. So, just to clarify, it's not the sulphides and the other poisons <coughs> and all the other issues that you get with coal that's really driving this. It's simply the CO2 uh, policy and strategy that we have. Sorry, I can't comment on that, Councillor. I'm not an expert in that field. But I would I'd just repeat that I think it's in line with our commitment, with LPG commitments to carbon zero. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Alder. Thank you. Um, my question is actually around point five, and that is um, about additional training. And um, is it your opinion that if we're going to um, have a building code that um, espouses um, warmer, drier, more efficient homes, that there should be some support for councils as to how we apply that and get training for our officers to, to um, understand it and apply it. Yeah, the submission seeks those extra training that the changes that are being proposed by MB include changes to uh, the amount of natural light, the weather tightness, the types of material being used and um, so our, our building assessors would need training as would all assessors for all territorial authorities so we'd ask government to support that training need. Um, the second question is, sorry my second question is do you think also it would be helpful for us to um, 
have that training available to people who are building houses and you know property developers etc as well I think that that would be outside of the the remit of this submission councillor thank you councillor Houlihan Thank you. Um, when you say that, does that mean that this just applies to council buildings or does it apply to all buildings getting done and consented in our city? It, it applies to all buildings. Right. But, but whether private people should be trained or not is not what this submission is asking for. I think it's a valid question, though, and as far as education and, um, you know, to build a relationship on that. W what... Um, obviously, this isn't. Our, it's not the <coughs> council pushing. This is from. Councillor, do you have a question? Yes, my question is, um, what sort of extra cost do you perceive a normal build might? You know, that, that this will. Um, do you think this will increase the cost of building? We we wouldn't be able to answer that. There'll there'll be some estimates on MB's website, but there's it's certainly not been quantified. As a um, governance and a, having a building department at council, do we have to consent these builds though? We'd need to consent any new building, yes. Right, so we'd have to consent them to these new standards if this is approved? If, if these proposed standards were to come in, yes. So would we not then have to know what sort of cost implications that would have or not? No. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Councillor Bence. I'm happy to move, Madam Chair. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Walker? Anyone wish to speak? Councillor Benson Pope, would you um, listen? I think, um, I think we're all only too aware of the efforts that the city and others, but Dunedin in particular, has made around, around the edges of the need for. Um, warm, dry, healthy housing. Uh, nowhere, <coughs> nowhere in Dunedin has a much greater um, appropriateness for that work. Uh, and we're lucky that we have such academics locally as uh, Philip Howden Chapman, who has been party of a, a joint um, study with MSD, actually, um, a decade or so ago in three cities, including Dunedin, which demonstrated unequivocally the benefits of warm, healthy, dry accommodation. And so I don't think any of us should be reluctant about advocating much more aggressive building standards. Um, Europeans still laugh pathetically at us uh, because of our appalling housing controls historically. Um, in, including houses facing the wrong way, uh, but we'll blame the palms for that, comrade. Um, and um, we've only slowly moved away from that bad design, bad orientation, and lack of uh, simple things like passive uh, capture of passive heating. So everything we, could, we should do, um, in addition to the steps that have been taken recently about glazing and insulation, should be further improved. I have to say that one thing that is missing from here, that is probably captured by the gas issue, is the extraordinary um, casualness in allowing non-vented gas heating appliances to be used in domestic situations. I think that's an insanity, uh, but I think it can be uh, an issue that can be attacked outside of this issue, and it's not relevant to the matter today, but I just want to put that on the record. So. I'm sure everyone will feel um, comfortable in supporting these improvements. The, as to the cost of um, building materials, well, I think we know that the capture of that market by a very small number of suppliers is more the problem uh, of building cost in Dunedin than decent regula in New Zealand, rather than decent regulations to ensure safe and safe and warm housing. Councillor Vandalus. You, you had your hand up to speak to the motion. Thank you. Um, I entirely agree with Councillor Benson Pope regarding his comment on unvented uh, portable gas heaters. They are simply a slow 
uh, carbon monoxide <coughs> poisoning device that should never be used indoors, and I don't know how it is that we still have them. Um, but in terms of trying to keep uh, buildings commercial and domestic warm and dry, um, I feel the need to remind Councillor Benson Pope that almost all of Northern Europe is keeping its buildings warm and dry with Russian natural gas. Uh, the gas uh, industry is by far the least polluting of the most available and affordable heating sources that exist. Um, New Zealand is actually somewhat behind Europe, uh, not just in its insulation and triple glazing uh, technology, but also in its um, keeping buildings at a very much lower and not so dry uh, environment as, as they have in Europe. Um, Europe is able to do it because of gas. Um, New Zealand could do it very cost effectively with gas as well. If we were to simply recognise that gas is far less polluting than most other energy sources, it burns far cleaner than any other fossil fuel, um, and New Zealand is blessed with a great deal of it. Uh, currently just pumped out of Taranaki, but there are all sorts of other places we could have had it as well, including off our own coast. I can't agree with a building submission that wants warmer, drier houses and yet denies the use of the very gas that could create effectively and economically those warmer, drier conditions for people. To me, this is a, a submission with uh, a, a good intent, uh, but it's been railroaded by the um, anti-CO2 uh, ideologies that have been mentioned earlier today, um, and it's completely uh, contradictory to suggest that we want warmer and drier houses, but that we're not going to allow people to heat them. Uh, so therefore, uh, especially because of the gas provisions in the submission, I can't vote for it. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I don't think anyone around this table or anyone in our city would disagree with the benefits of having a warm, dry house. Um, I've worked with Beacon Parkways and with Best Home um, over the years, so I'm very aware of the standards and of sustainable housing, and um, so I'm fully in support of it. However, my reservation is around um, the fact that it will once again be the um, possibly a deterrent to some people building a home because it will mean the costs could increase. And um, I, I just think well, that that's the only reason why um, a lot of people don't insulate their own home, um, you know, or do some of these things because of the cost. So if my concern is, I don't mind an opt-in or opt-out option, but if we make it, you know, if it's made compulsory, so um, that you have to do it, that then imposes quite a cost on people. Whereas if it's someone who's got a lot of money, there's no issue, it's not a problem. However, our most vulnerable, um, you know, Māori or lower socioeconomic um, groups, it cannot, you know, often cannot afford that extra cost. And let's just face it, it's not just um, those most vulnerable groups, it's also middle New Zealand that are your mum and dads who are just wanting to buy a you know, build a home right now in a housing crisis. The ha price of houses has gone through the roof, so some people are looking at building because there's some incentives with building. However, this will probably, very likely, push up the cost of building, and that's why I'd have a concern with it. Um, I agree with it 100%, but somehow I think we need, if the government's bringing it in through MB, let's find ways to fund it you know, for people who can't afford it, because I think no one would not want it, but they might not be able to afford it. So let's not make it out of reach for everyday people. Councillor O'Malley. Madam Chair, um, it would be inconsistent of us to set up a policy of carbon neutral 2030 and then, um, then support the idea of mining carbon fossil fuels. Uh, just a straight out inconsistency of policy. 
Um, the other aspect of my own personal experience is having built to the North American code, um, the New Zealand code's ridiculous when it comes to insulation. And, and I can attest to having left a building where the temperature was set at four degrees Celsius while I was away for the winter and my neighbours came in to check on it and it was never below 15 degrees. Furnace never went on because it was so well insulated. And in this environment, and that was minus 10 outside. In this, in, in this environment, a well-built house, and there's one being built in North East Valley about four blocks away from me, passive house. We almost don't need any energy if we build to the right level. So the idea that you would substitute bad building practices with the use of fossil fuels is, again, no longer relevant thinking in this time with the crisis that we face. Any further speakers? Um, I'm going to support the motion, um, but I do, I do make the comment that one of the issues that we have uh, currently is that our builders, our um, building consultants, um, those uh, particularly uh, on the front line doing the work, and often uh, their clients, don't necessarily understand um, the, the reasons why. Uh, it's just a hassle and there's more cost. And so this is another one of those situations where we need to take the community with us on the journey, and not just us, MB actually needs to, the government needs to, um, to understand why we're doing this. The aims are laudable and they're important and they're crucial to achieve warm dry houses. And as Councillor O'Malley said, um, we can't have a zero uh, carbon um, goal by 2030 uh, and then uh, not support this. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But we do need, we do need to understand uh, that on the ground there are complications and communication issues about taking the whole community with us. Uh, you're right of reply, Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Your Assistant Worship. Um, I'd just like to reinforce and thank Councillor O'Malley for the comments you made about um, technology. I have some friends who built a passive house. The architect objected to them putting any extra heating inside. Um, their theory is that a hairdryer is enough. Um, they didn't agree, but they have an amazingly energy efficient house. Um, that wasn't hugely expensive compared with other building methods. Uh, and the illustration of the point of having um, building control rules with great gaps in them that allow heat, however sourced, to flow out through them, metaphorically speaking, um, is pretty obvious to everyone. As to you, Councillor Houlihan, well, I'm glad you agree with having 100% with having better standards, and I'm disappointed to see that you're not going to support them. That's what you said. So we're going to take this by division. I'm going to put the motion, although uh, I will hand it over to uh, Lynn to take it by division. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Sorry, Councillor Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Vandivis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Carried 12-1. Thank you, and if somebody could perhaps, uh, oh, thank you so much, Chief. Uh, we'll just take a short adjournment. Oh no, here he comes, we don't need an adjournment at all. I'll hand back over to His Worship. Starting without him would seem premature, but welcome, Mr. Logie. Item 22, financial result for the period ended 30th of April. This final item on the public agenda and the heating system appears to have kicked in, which is helpful. 
Yeah. Uh, nothing from you. I'll probably just to say, um, if we refer councillors to page 343, we've just got the the three key graphs that we present each each month. Um, just indicating that the operating surplus excluding Waipori is tracking ahead of budget. Um, obviously reflection of that additional uh, activity through the landfill. Uh, operating cash flow is still strong um, compared to budget, which is, which is positive. And probably the one that's, that's showing a, um, a different trend from previous is the capital expenditure. So we've seen an uplift in the last couple of months in capital expenditure, um, primarily in the Three Waters area. There's certainly um, with obviously what's happening in uh, Edinburgh Street uh, is adding to that to that spend, so that's that's a positive move. So happy to take any questions, but the purpose of giving you this is obviously um, having this sort of the latest financial position prior to uh, your deliberations next week on the 10-year plan. Councillor Lord, yeah, um, Gavin, I was looking at that capex, not the graph, but the page, a uh, couple of pages on from that, where it's got them by department. And um, I just did note that uh, Three Waters had spent uh, 26 million year to date, and that was their budget. And I was quite pleased to see that. And I see actually transport still done 40 million of 47 budgeted. So um, probably, I guess, what I'm trying to ask is that a better? Um, I guess what I'm what I'm wanting to know is that a better outcome of the shortfall areas? Are they perhaps slightly less important, the areas of like corporate services and, and arts and culture, um, parks and rec, would, would it potentially mean that although the capex is falling behind, it's still going ahead in the right places? Would that be a better way to ask it? It's probably not for me to comment on the, the merits of, of individual groups. All, all we can say is that certainly there's been an uplift in the programme um, and so we're looking like we'll be delivering between that 95 and 100 million dollar mark, um, which obviously then sets us on a trajectory that hopefully we can start lifting lifting this the spend for the next uh, the next year. And what I would say is my expectation is that all capital projects have a priority, regardless of what area of the budget they are, be they parks, property, um, corporate services. So if there's something in here, our commitment is that we are trying to deliver projects for the community. So they're all important. Some are just, um, you know, have more immediate impacts. Would it be fair to say, though, if you're regrassing a sports field and that didn't get done for a year, that might be less impact than uh, failing to deliver on a water main or something like that? Well, it depends. It probably if depends who you ask. Yeah. And I think it's important, you know, and there are different people doing that work. So part of our plan to um, focus on getting stuff done is to ensure that we're keeping a wide range of staff and contractors delivering the right things to the community to meet the levels of service that we've committed to. Councillor Elder, then Councillor Barker. Thank you. Um, just a question related to that. Um, w would you say that... Um, uh, that, that the capital expend in, in infrastructure is an indication that our contracting with um, Fulton Hogan and Downer and, and, and the parameters around that are allowing us to deliver now um, on, on the capital works that we need to do. Probably if you look at it in relation to the Edinburgh Street, how quickly we were able to mobilise to put that renewal in place is probably an indicator of, of that. Thank you. Councillor Barker. I just want to check in around, um, again going back to the CAPEX, the, am I correct that the um, full year's CAPEX budget is $126 million? And you're saying that you financially think that there will be around $100 million delivered. So I just wonder if the um, financial reporting lines up, and I guess this is for the chief executive, with the operational forecast on what projects might be delivered. Are we looking at 80% of projects being delivered? Most of them are in delivery, or a good proportion of them, but it's timing. So we're not going to propose any capital carry forwards into next year because we know, for example, that there are some projects that are still being delivered, but there are budget lines for next year, and there's already a reasonably ambitious number 
in year one of the draft 10-year plan, and we don't want to add another $25 million of things that we know are in delivery on top of that. But So it, it, it's complicated. There will be, there'll be a decent discussion around this next week um, in the context of all of the operating budgets and the capital budgets, but it was just important that we got the most recent current accounts to you, as, you know, so that you had that information in advance of that. Councillor Lord. Yeah, I just had another question. This is probably for you, Sandy, but the um, favourable personnel spend is, um, obviously you said in the commentary that you've got some positions unfilled. Is it your hope long term to reduce, or is it, is it an area that you could aim to reduce spend and, and reduce budget overall? Is that your...? Well, it dep that, and that's challenging. My, my aim is to right-size the organisation to deliver what it is that Council asks us to do. Now, if that means um, more staff and more spending in that area and, and fewer consultants, then I'm open to that, then that's what I'll do. If it means fewer staff and doing less, then I'll do that. It depends entirely on the direction that you set, so I'm not... I'm pleased to see that we've achieved some savings in that area, but that depends on what you want to get done. Councillor Fissel. Tanako, Your Worship. Thank you so much, um, Mr Logie. Um, I, I just am looking at uh, page 347, and it's just my lack of fiscal or whatever understanding, probably. Uh, so the community and planning, the 74,000, is that a, um, a deficit or a, a not underspend or what, please? What that is is where we've um, looked at what's been spent in that area and some of it can be from previous years and actually worked out that actually it was operating expenditure, not capital expenditure. I'll move that we extend the length of the meeting beyond six hours. Second to Councillor Gary. All those in favour? I don't mean that liberally. Those against? Uh, that's carried. Sorry, Councillor Raddick. And just looking at the statement of position, I suppose in a more traditional sense, because we've got a range of different objectives for our finances, but I just wanted to check, to me, it looks like our current position has deteriorated a bit as we've our current assets are down a bit, our liabilities are up a bit, so that we're sort of 15 million short there, and then our non-current shows an increase in debt of 26 million for a de total deterioration of our position of 41 million, offset by revaluations of 46 million. Is that, does that fit with your view of the position? So we're still, as a statement of position, we're still ahead, Due to revaluations. So, so, if you look at the financial position, the current liabilities include the, the borrowings that we're doing at the moment for this year. What will happen at the end of the year is that will drop into the long-term liability line, in which case actually then it reclassifies it. So then your, your your cash position looks okay. It's just the way we classify it during the year when we as we're borrowing that money. And thank you, Councillor Houlihan. The answer is probably going to be no, but does this mean that we have a surplus in community and culture? <laughs> so this, the spend in the community and planning group is, is around the citywide amenity plan. So again, there's been li very little money spent in that area. So does it mean this year, financial year, we have a surplus? Or? It means we have an underspend in that particular <laughs> capital category. Underspend, that means surplus. <laughs> Can we... <laughs> Now, I think, is there any reason why we can't carry that forward and use it on projects that are really needed? Why is that given, Mr so Logie? If it, if it, if, as as um, the Chief alluded to, um, we've, we've elected not to have carry forwards this year, because effectively if you carry forward what you haven't spent this year into next year, you have to then look at the whole programme and move some stuff out of the end of the year into the next year. So. What, with the 150 odd million dollars that we've got budgeted for next year, we think there's plenty of money to deliver the capital programme that council wishes us to do, based on the on the draft budgets. Thank you. I'd like to move the recommendations moved by Councillor Lord, seconded Councillor Hall. 
you like to speak to it, Councillor? I will just briefly. Look, I'll just say um, the accounts are what the accounts are. Um, I guess the one thing that I'm mindful of is the fact that we did receive the $7 million from the uh, water reform money, and so if that money wasn't there, um, that uh, current surplus that we're running uh, would be behind in much uh, probably worse than budget. So, um, yeah, and, and I think it is positive that we um, have made some savings, or that the chief has made some savings in the operating uh, in terms of the uh, personnel costs. But I guess uh, just a wee word, I would say there is a difference. It's it's not just as simple to say more work costs more personnel. Sometimes it can be about doing things more efficiently and and much smarter, but I'm sure you know that too, so, yeah. Further speakers? And just to that point around the, the Three Waters funding, I mean, that was to some degree the intention of the funding being offered as stimulus, uh, acknowledging the challenging um, times that local governments and local communities were facing going through uh, going through uh, COVID and so it's useful uh, in this current uh, financial year. Councillor Houlihan. It seems to me that the ALT members who have been prudent with their money and have surpluses are not benefiting from that. So my advice would be if they want to get their projects done, they spend as much as they can on, with that budget to get the things achieved that they want done in sensible spending, obviously, not to cause a lot of ratepayer increases but um, it does seem a bit unfair when a department has been very prudent with their money and they don't get the benefits of that. Executive leadership team will continue to take direction from the chief executive which is probably helpful in this instance. Uh, further speakers? Councillor Lord your right of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. I'll move per the order paper that we move into non-public for the reasons outlined in the agenda and that the meeting adjourn to enable members of the public and the media to leave. Seconded Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed.